Welcome back to episode 147 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh. I'm here with Troy. We've survived Christmas, and mm-hmm. we use the word survive not figuratively, but literally. So as we've chronicled, you were you had the plague. I had the plague. And you are better. Better. I, w- I think I was at your house Thursday before, night before Christmas, and I was there for maybe a half hour, and something was brewing. You ever like wake up where you have like a stiff neck, and it's like hard to move? your head yeah. and it's uncomfortable to sleep something had been kind of going on in the old neck department that day <laughs> go to your house everything is fine drive home and by that night it's really really starting to bother me now about six years ago i had the st- stiff neck of all stiff necks where it was completely locked up it was horrible pain i literally yeah. spent a week at my in-laws because they had a lazy boy chair and we didn't have one like <laughs> because i couldn't sleep in a bed i had to sleep in a chair it came back the sequel with a vengeance with a vengeance <laughs> it was the sequel and so friday saturday and sunday were a blur like i was telling you troy a minute before we started recording it, it, we sort of brag about how we've never missed a show even though we know it's gonna happen <laughs> and had we recorded on sunday instead of having our master class episode kind of in the can and ready to drop <laughs> I wouldn't have made it. I'm, I was a total. Would you have been like, like this the whole time? Like you couldn't get in the frame because you're. Oh, dude, dude, I was a, so Christmas Eve, there's always a traditional. It's a lot of fun. My 94 year old grandmother, who still drives, by the way, which is kind of <laughs> incredible, has a she's at like a like a senior home or yeah. apartments and they have a community center. And we always have like a big family Christmas Eve celebration there. So we go. I didn't go to church. You know, sorry, Jesus. Uh, Because I just couldn't do it. And then they came back and they got me. I'm there for like 50 minutes. And my wife said, I'm a total zombie. And at some point, she's like, I'm taking you home. So I don't even remember Christmas Eve and being at my grandparents. I, I, I told you earlier, too. The first two nights, I think I slept about two hours total between the two nights. It was yeah, awful. That's no because good. when you when it's that painful, it yeah. actually hurts worse to lie down yeah. than it does to, to stand up. So here's, but here's the funniest part of all of this. So Troy, our show is, we've said before, I mean, it's not like a, you know, you wouldn't think this, but it's actually hard to make this show. Like it <laughs> takes a lot of hours worth the research to do. And I hate getting behind. I don't like that feeling. I always like to feel like I'm actually a little bit of head. So even in my delirium, as the days are rolling on, and I'm <laughs> miserable. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not doing anything to work on today's show. And so there was a point where I probably spent maybe, 45 minutes of time where I worked on the show and kind of started to work on some of our segments. Then yesterday morning where I'm, I've kind of like feel like a human being again, Troy, I go back to kind of pick up where I left off. And I'm taking <laughs> myself, because, dude, it made no sense. <laughs> and I, I shouldn't have erased them. I should have kept them. Cause it would have been really funny <laughs> to like, like do the segments as Josh and a zombified, <laughs> state uh, you know under heavy narcotics and not <laughs> making any sense whatsoever but honestly it was like every sentence was like a whole random other thought and <laughs> sentences didn't make sense to begin with so uh, i yesterday though i started to turn the corner and i feel much better so nice. yeah it was a, a kind of a wild christmas where i, I don't remember most of it but uh, we're better we're back now the minnetonka skippers girls high school hockey team is in the midst of a big Christmas state tri- or Christmas yep. tournament. Big Christmas How are you guys tournament. doing? We're two and zero. Oh. We're in the championship game tomorrow, six p.m. against probably Andover. It looks like. Okay. Will you be number one in the state rankings again if you come away with the championship here? I don't know. It'll be weird because Hill Murray lost to Lakeville North four to two, which was boggled my mind. We Lakeville North lost to Farmington who we beat nine to zip or 10 to zip. So it just makes no sense. I don't know if we win this tournament. Yeah. We're probably number one because Andover is always number two or three and they're always good if we can beat them. Uh, But we'll see. That's going to be a physical bunch of penalties probably tomorrow. Big game. There we go. Now do the girls care? Like, I know we talked about how these are kind of these tournaments are a big deal on our last show. Uh, Do you kind of get the sense that they really want to win it? They do because they get a t-shirt. And so the T-shirt is the big thing. They get a T-shirt that says they won the tournament, so they want that. Okay. Well, hey, whatever it takes. <laughs> this is also our last episode that will drop in 2023. 
Sweet. So, that's something. Yeah. Made it a whole nother year. Uh, <laughs> big, show, big show, huge show today. Lots and lots planned. So we're going to get right to it. But before, quickly, before we do, a reminder that the Hockey Cards Gone Show podcast is a Patreon podcast, which means we rely on the support of listeners like yourself to help us cover our show expenses, help us to produce more and hopefully better hockey card content, and then fund initiatives even in a small way to grow the hockey card hobby. How you can support us is we've partnered with Patreon. We have a out of 199 support level tier. That means you'd be one of the first essentially 200 supporters of our show. It starts at $5 a month. Uh, so we think pretty cheap. You also get access to our Gong Show Discord server and kind of insider access to participate in our show. It's very easy to do. You can go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com, and click on the Become a Patron link at the top of the page. Or you go to Patreon directly, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. If you're listening to us on a social on a podcast app, there's a link in the description. If you're watching us on YouTube, there's a link in the description there as well. And then finally, in our Instagram and TikTok profiles, we have a link there too. We have one new patron since our last show, D Smith out of 199. Haven't seen him, I don't think, in Discord yet. So anybody that's signed up for our Patreon that's not in the Discord, message us anywhere. You can message us on Patreon, Instagram. Uh, you can throw rocks at Troy's window <laughs> all the night. Uh, just get a hold of us, and we'll make sure you get in. All right, Troy, you ready for the game plan? On today's show, we begin with the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 46. And then we look at the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 47. Then it's time for another edition of Rookie Deep Dive. This is followed by Hobby News. Next, we take a look at the stories that rocked the hockey hobby in 2023. Then it's off to new product releases. We end the show with a look at some of our favorite hockey cards in the this week's current PWCC weekly auction. And we end with personal pickup. I didn't have any, but Josh does. So he keeps us going, I think, every week for personal pickups. Okay, Josh, we have a two-for-one special. We didn't do an NHL almost greatest player to wear number 46 last episode. Therefore, we are going to be doing the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 46 and the almost greatest player to wear number 47. So I'm going to make both these kind of short just so we're not sitting here for 30 minutes. But, Josh, previously we looked at the greatest NHL player that wore the number that matched our episode number. We ran through all the numbers, so now we are looking at the almost greatest NHL player to wear each number from the runners-up in the Hockey Writers' Greatest NHL Player to Wear Each Number article. Josh, the almost greatest NHL player to wear number 46 for the nominees in the Hockey Writers' Greatest NHL Player to Wear Each Number article and selected by me is our boy Josh. I didn't even know this. Jared Spurgeon. Homer pick. Homer, Homer pick. pick. I love it. I love yep. it. Jared Spurgeon, the other nominee at number 46 was Andre. I don't even know how to say this. Holy name. Kost- moly. Kostitsin. <laughs> Kostitsin. Remember but, our family show here, Troy. Yeah, I know. That was the other one. The other nominee at 46. And as a reminder, the greatest to wear number 46 was David Krejci. All right, Josh, here we go. Jared Spurgeon, he's a defenseman from Edmonton, Alberta. Spurgeon was selected 156th overall in the 2008 NHL entry draft by the New York Islanders. However, he was unable to come to terms with the Islanders and would go on to sign with the Minnesota Wild as a free agent in September 2010. Spurgeon has played in 864 regular season NHL games over a current 14-season NHL career. Currently, our boy Spurgeon is injured, but listed as day-to-day, like us all, on the Wilds injury chart. Yeah. He's been injured all <laughs> he's been injured all year. Yeah, and he's always listed as day to day. Spurgeon has played his entire career with the Minnesota Wild. For his awards and accomplishments, no individual hardware or accomplishments. However, he did get second in the Lady Bing voting for the 2020-21 NHL season. Very prestigious I, Lady Bing. I, I love in our notes how you have no awards, no accomplishments. <laughs> You've accomplished nothing, Jared. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. All right, for his career, he has 110 goals, 273 assists for 383 points. Spurgeon has made the playoffs in 10 of his previous 13 NHL seasons. I'm not including this season yet. Compiling eight goals, 21 assists for 29 points in 67 NHL playoff games played. The best season of his NHL career from a point standpoint was his 2018-19 season where Spurgeon had 14 goals, 29 assists for 43 points in 82 games played with the Wild. 
A little bit about Spurgeon. Steady, solid defenseman. He's been a mainstay on the back end for the Wild for the past 14 seasons, basically. He's always back there. He's known for his small stature, but definitely plays bigger than his five foot nine height. And I will tell you this that five foot nine height is being super generous because I have stood next to Jared Spurgeon at Braemar Arena watching youth hockey. And I towered over him, and I'm six foot. And he, I was way taller than him. He five nine is very generous. Well, can I add something else to that? Yeah. To his stature. He perennially looks like he's 12 years old. I know. <laughs> he has like Benjamin Button's disease. Like yeah. you would think that he's like a high school kid if you yeah. were standing right next to him. I ripped one, but he does <laughs> not look as like he's a guy in his 30s. No, he uh he definitely does look young. Spurgeon is also known as a smooth skater who can lead the rush when needed. Spurgeon also rarely takes penalties, and in fact, over his 13 full NHL seasons, has averaged 11 penalties in minutes per year that is crazy i didn't realize it was that low i knew he didn't take a lot but that's way low which is insane all right josh as mentioned previously our boy spurgeon still currently playing in the nhl for the wild currently injured again but should be back on the ice maybe someday who knows we keep hearing he's making progress but haven't seen him lately for his fun interesting facts Spurgeon was named wild captain on January 3rd, 2021, the second full-time captain in Minnesota wild franchise history. First yeah, well, what did they do? They changed they it all the time. They under- were ro- did this rotating thing. And then I don't know. So Koivu was the first one. Me- or, uh, Miko Koivu Miko. was like the first full-time, but I'm surprised they didn't give it to some stupid thing. Like the fans, the fans are our captain. Like it's so if dumb. you took a hundred <laughs> NHL fans, like real NHL fans across <laughs> North America, not in Minnesota, yeah, and you ask them who is the captain of the Minnesota Wild, <laughs> no what one. percentage of a hundred do you think would guess Jared Spurgeon? Two, <laughs> two. No, I don't think anybody knows who he is. Really, yeah. he's not, he's not that. He's a good player, right? Yeah. He's just not a remarkable player. Yeah, and I think he's an example of a captain for leadership abilities, not necessarily because he's like Wayne Gretzky. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if he's sitting there screaming at him, you know, lead by example kind of guy, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So, all right. And then our second fun fact, he scored his 100th NHL goal in a four, three overtime loss at the Bruins on October 22nd, 2022. That's just me. Like the most Minnesota wild thing ever. Awesome yeah. job. You scored your hundredth goal, but we lost. Sorry, but not, not too much fun facts for our boy. All right, his rookie card, 2010, upper deck, number 472, Young Guns. PSA 10 has a whopping pop of nine with a gem rate of 75%. Last sale, Josh, August 4th of this year for $60.99 US. Surprises so me go. it's that high. And I think the pop nine supports the notion that nobody knows who this guy is. <laughs> it's very true, very true. All right, so that's our boy. That's our boy, Jared Spurge. That was number 46. So now it's off to number 47. Oh, who did I have for 47? All right, Josh. The gr- almost greatest NHL player to wear, number 47, and selected by me, is our guy, I guess, Tori Krug. I had to look that up. I think I want to say Krug. It just makes me want to say Krug, but it's Krug. The other- that is an amazing picture, Troy. Yeah, right here. This, this- who, Who's 47 for the why, – why am I drawing a blank? Is that like – For who, Boston? This is Tori Krug. Yeah. Right here. Oh, it is Tori Krug. That's him. So if you look up video of him, this hit is always on. I think that I can't remember who that is. Robert Thomas, maybe. But he just drills him. <laughs> like this greatest picture ever. Yeah. So I didn't Tory... know he played for Boston. Oh yeah. Played his first. Oh. You'll see. He played a long time All for right. Boston. All right. The other nominee at number 47 was Mark Andre Bergeron. And as a reminder, the greatest to our number 47 was Alexander Radul- Radulov. So our boy, very Jared Spurgeon like. When we get to his height and everything, defenseman born in Livonia, Michigan. Krug, again, was never drafted and went on to play three years of college hockey at Michigan State. After his third season at Michigan State, Krug was one of the most sought after college hockey free agents and signed with the Boston Bruins on March 25th, 2012. Krug has played in 734 regular season NHL games over a current. 13 season NHL career. 
Krug played his first nine seasons with the Boston Bruins. He has played his okay, last so a cup of coffee. Yeah, cup of coffee. Stayed there for a little bit. He's played his last four seasons with the St. Louis Blues. For okay. his awards and accomplishments, he was a member of the 2013-14 All-Rookie Team. For his career, 86 goals, 374 assists for 460 points. Krug has made the playoffs in seven of his previous 12 NHL seasons, compiling 11 goals, 46 assists for 57 points and 82 NHL playoff games played. Best season of his NHL career from a point standpoint was his 2017-18 season where Krug had 14 goals, 45 assists for 59 points and 76 games played with the Bruins. Just like Jared Spurgeon, Krug is undersized as an NHL defenseman at 5 foot 9, 186 pounds. His size has actually been noted as probably one of the reasons that he went undrafted. But since making his name known in the 2013 Stanley Cup playoffs with Boston, Krug has become a staple on the blue line in the NHL. Also, as mentioned previously, Krug is still currently playing in the NHL for the St. Louis Blues. On this current NHL season, Krug has one goal, 15 assists for 16 points in 33 games played. It's pretty crazy how his career like, is a mirror image almost of Spurgeon. Height, stats, yeah. they're pretty close, little guys. But Krug will throw his weight around. There's tons of videos. He. He does not hold back. So well, he's his, kind of a log jamming my yeah. hometown guy, Scotty yeah, Prunovich, right now. Prunovich. From, 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 who had two assists tonight when I last checked in their game when the Blues were playing somebody. But <laughs> yeah, it's Scotty is very similar stature to Spurgeon and Krug, and they have very similar uh, offensive abilities. And so we, the young uh, Prunovich has been getting a lot of press box time no. because you, know, you got. Krug in the way there. All right. Fun, interesting fact. In 2012, Krug was named the CCHA Player of the Year and was a finalist for the Hobie Baker Award. Krug scored his first NHL goal during his first Stanley Cup playoff game in the Eastern Conference semifinals against the New York Rangers. Krug became the first Bruins defenseman to score in his playoff debut since Glenn Wesley in 1988. Krug followed this by scoring his second NHL goal during Game 2 of the same series becoming the fourth player in Bruins history to score goals in his first two playoff games. At the conclusion of the series, he became the first rookie defenseman in NHL history to score four goals in his first five playoff games. That's some deep knowledge. That's some deep trivia right there. There you go. Keep that, keep that one in your back pocket. All right, his rookie card, Josh. 2012, number 205, Young Guns. PSA 10 has a pop of 45, so a little bit more than our boy Spurgeon. Gem rate is 68%. Last sale I could find was April 9th of this year via eBay, verified in therapy for $89.95 US. There we go. A couple of good, solid, not and offensive current, defensemen. Current players. Current. I like that. Current, current players. players. Yeah, that is cool. Well, we're going to go from a couple of veterans, Troy, to Ricky Deep Dive where we get the opportunity to learn a lot more about one of the 2023-24 NHL rookies that are making a name for them for themselves so far this season. It's also our weekly opportunity to see our good buddy Neil, a.k.a. Irish Flyers collector, lose his mind as Bobby Brink just can't find his way to the top of the votes. So in fact, Roy, I w actually went and looked this up. This week marks the eighth straight appearance of Minnetonka High School's, your very own school, uh, own Bobby Brink, as a rookie deep dive candidate, you know, kind of impressive in a sad sort of a way, I guess. I think he's been number two in the votes, like six of those eight times. So, yeah, pretty brutal there. But before we get into the rest of this week's candidates, we have to do a quick review of the 2023-24 rookies we've covered so far. Matthew Nyes in episode 80, then Luke Hughes, 84, Devin Levi, episode 125, Matthew Coronado in episode 127, Dustin Wolf, episode 129, Ridley Gregg, 131, Marco Rossi, 133, Matthew Potois in 135, Pavel Minchukov in episode 137, Grant Clark in 139, Brock Faber in 141, Luke Evangelista in 143, and then last week, Joseph Wool in episode 145. So I think that, that we, now if you look at even last year's crop tour, I think we're up to like 32 or 33 rookie deep dives now since we started, which brings us to this week's candidates. So we know we have Bobby Brink, then the upstart. Calgary Flames rookie Connor Zary, Lucas Dostal, 
new to the list this week. And then Dimitri Vronkov. So the results are in. We actually had a few hundred votes. And uh, thanks to everyone for voting. Holy smoke, story it happened. Bobby Brink, with a healthy 39% of the votes, took the crown this week after, again, an eight-week marathon on the list to become this week's rookie deep dive candidate. So, Neil, we're bring, are you crying? Do we need to stop the show? Give you a minute to collect yourself. You did it. Uh, you want to congratulate Neil, Trey? I'm guessing Neil figured out how to vote like multiple times and created fake accounts because <laughs> he had some really feet. he had some sweet posters going in our Discord about, about the Bobby Brink campaign. Yeah, he's been campaigning pretty hard, but Bobby's a good player, and we're going to learn a lot more about him. Yeah. So he's very well deserving on, and he's doing well this year too. He's yeah. up there in the rookie scoring leaders, so uh, it'll be fun to learn more about him. So Bobby Brink Troy is 22 years old, hails from Chaska, Minnesota. Home of Hazeltine National <laughs> Golf Club, probably most famous from where when Payne Stewart won the U.S. Open yep. before he died. That's a golf course uh, that he won it on. Another smaller guy. Are there no tall people in, in the NHL? 5'8", 170 pounds. Now, this is probably the greatest fun fact ever, Troy. <laughs> His middle name is epic. You know your parents are going to make you play hockey when they name you Bobby or Brink. His yeah, middle name that's is pretty. Or. That's pretty pretty good. What if he was terrible? And now his parents are like, you bring shame to the Bobby Orr name. I'm 5'8". My name is Bobby Orr, and I want to play <laughs> basketball. I don't think that's going to work out really well. He was drafted 34th overall in the 2019 NHL entry draft by the Philadelphia Flyers. Prior to that, Brink played a couple of seasons at Minnetonka High School, where, of course, Troy is the girls' high school uh, goalie coach. Were you there when Brink was playing? No, I think he, I think we started, he would have been, I think, gone. no, it might've been his last season there when we started. If I remember. He also right. played a couple of years with the Sioux city Musketeers in the USHL. So I think he was at Minnetonka for two years, maybe, maybe three. Yeah. Last season, in Troy in Sioux city, he put up 35 goals, 33 assists for 68 points and 43 games played. The 35 goals was a Musketeers franchise record in the USHL. Also, he was named that season the 2019 USHL Forward of the Year. Uh, pretty good to peak in your draft eligible year. Yep. That, that yep. always works out. So prior to the draft, uh, I found a scouting report from Cam, Cam Robinson from Elite Prospects. Here's what he said about Bobby Brink. After feasting on the USHL <laughs> competition this season, Brink was the lone non-NTDP, so was that national... National Development Brain. Yeah. Yeah, it's the USA National Development Team. I feel like the acronyms mixed up or something. I don't know. National Development Team. So he's the lone non one of those guys added to the American <laughs> squad at the World U18 Championships. Looked dangerous alongside Matt Boldy and Alex Turcotte, even at even strength. Brink finds soft spaces and makes the opposition pay in a hurry. He can read the play quicker than most and boasts the vision and release to act as a dual threat. An elite brain. Elite brain. I like it. An elite it. brain. On the flip side, Troy, he owns an ugly stride. <laughs> that lacks quickness or impressive top end speed. He'll need to place immense focus on that skill or risks falling behind when he levels up to the professional ranks. He's off to the University of Denver in the fall. Honestly, for pure laughter and entertainment, I could read <laughs> scouting reports. All day. <laughs> I just think they're the greatest. <laughs> It's got an elite brain, but an ugly stride. <laughs> it's Bobby Brink. Well, Troy Brink did head off to the University of Denver and as a freshman in 2019-20, finished second in NCHC in rookie scoring with 24 points. I think college hockey has the most acronyms that people have no idea what they stand for. Yeah, it's they getting kind of crazy. And then we're going to... It's it's nuts, and then who knows what's going on? There's a whole bunch of rumors about stuff that's going to happen coming up in the next five years. So who knows? Mm, interesting. He also averaged 0.86 point per games as a freshman. Was named to the All NCHC rookie team, whatever that is. As a junior in 2021-22, he finished the season as the NCAA scoring champion. 13 goals, 44 assists for 57 points was also named the NCHC Player of the Year and the NCHC Forward of the Year. National Plus, 
National Collegiate Hockey Conference. <laughs> there we go. Now we know. He, he led the Denver Pioneers to the 2022 NCAA National Championship and was a Hobie Baker finalist that year, losing to Dryden McKay from Minnesota State University, which is, that's what we call Mankato State University. Yeah, it's Mankato State. Don't ever call it Minnesota State. <laughs> I went to the University of Minnesota. I think most people know. And when you having hockey, and this was like in the glory days of the WCHA or WHA. Wait, what was WCHA? It? Yeah. WCHA. Yeah. When Denver was in our conference and Mankato State was too, uh, what Minnesota State, whatever it's called now, we were so brutal to that <laughs> team. The two things that we would chant were junior college over and over again and Gophers rejects the entire <laughs> game. That's so all. I'll never, uh, never forget doing that. But <laughs> I never heard of Ryden McKay. Did you? I did not. Yeah. Where are we? Brink signed a three-year entry-level contract with the Flyers in April 2022. Played a short 10-game stint with the team at the end of that season where he didn't score a goal but got four assists. Then he spent all last year in the AHL with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. In 41 games played, he put up 12 goals, 16 assists for 28 points. Then this season, Troy, he made the Flyers roster out of training camp. Uh, and through 28 games so far, he has six goals, 10 assists for 16 points. He's currently sixth in eligible uh, rookies for, or called their eligible rookies for goal scored this season, and eighth amongst rookies in points. I want to make a note, too, about him making the team this year. It was not a sure thing to make the team, and was kind of the last man pick, actually, what they said for the roster, but has exceeded Philadelphia's expectations so far. In a recent article, Morgan te teammate Morgan Frost had this to say about Bobby Brink. He's just a really smart player. Line mate, uh, Morgan Frost said, I think he's probably the best passer on the team, too. He's got really good vision, unbelievable offensive instincts, and an ugly stride. No, he didn't say it. <laughs> and an elite brain. An elite brain. <laughs> brain is elite. Brink has been elevated as of late to the second line, playing with Brian Paling and Joel Farabee. Also seen time in the second power play unit. So, uh, off to a pretty good start this year in his rookie campaign. Yeah, sounds like it. Bobby Brink is a 2022-23 Young Guns. His PSA 10 pop 45 with a 40% gem rate. Last sold on November 3rd for 103 US dollars. Not a lot of sales, right? Maybe some with lower PSA pricing and $100. Yeah. You know, might be a time to dig through those dollar boxes and find your Bobby Brinks. Now, I don't think he's going to turn into like a Jack Hughes kind of guy, but you know he has some. He's had some big years. Uh, obviously, led the NCAA in scoring, so uh, you know could be a a good solid top six contributor probably. Mm -hmm. to the Flyers. And his middle name is Orr. Orr, and he's from Minnetonka, kinda. <laughs> Chaska, but went to Minnetonka. He's smart. He knows where where to go. I don't think Chaska's hockey team is very good, are they? Uh, at times they can't because they're combined. I well, I can't remember if the boys are the girls are. They're Chaska Chan or Chaska oh. and Chan Hassan, but I can't remember if the boys are or not. If they're still separate. Gotcha. All right, that's rookie deep dive for this week. Uh, we'll look. Uh, I don't know if we're going to take a pause. Maybe as we and wait a few weeks till we get closer to series two, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah. Want to make a quick mention for Gong Show partner and sponsor Slab Sharks. Uh, many thanks to them again for their support of our show. We wish the team over there. Uh, happy New Year's. Uh, once again, Troy, they don't technically have one of their mega eBay auctions again this week, but there's still a ton of great hockey cards at auction that all end again tonight. So I, I have no idea if this is what Slab Sharks non auctions look like. I cannot <laughs> wait for their real auctions to kick back up because uh, this there's this week's auction is just loaded again. So again, head to Slab Sharks for a link to the auction. Maybe buy yourself a nice little Christmas present. Now that you've taken care of your family and loved ones, or maybe even a nice card for your podcast co-host. I don't know, Troy. <laughs> and then once again, if you're a Canadian citizen, and you just live there, I guess, maybe maybe a, on a visa or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> have some hockey cards. You'd love to turn into some cash. We recommend Slab Sharks eBay consignment services. It's turnkey, which means basically they do it all. You just ship them your cards or drop them off, maybe at a local card show where they have representatives or and then basically just take it from there. So you don't have to try to take the perfect photo. You don't have to worry about doing filling out the listings correctly. 
getting back to buyers timely when they have questions, hunting down payment, or even shipping to the U.S. So, Troy, I, and the shipping to the U.S. thing, wow, I'm going to go from the other way, the U.S. to Canada. Yeah, what happened? really hits home with me because I just shipped a bigger card that we sold to Canada. Total nightmare. I, we used FedEx, and it was just the mis- most miserable experience I've ever had. Right? So you go, and we use this uh, Shippo platform, and you print out everything. I print it out and then I I have like the package and you know you can like just like with the postal service or UPS yeah. you just put the package you know like tape it to your bubble mailer or whatever. No. no. And usually good to go. And I, I thought to myself it's like man this is international. It's a big card. I I want to drop it off and like make sure it's cool. Yeah. So go to the Kinko's FedEx place and FedEx guy go to the counter I said I have this I bought this through one of your affiliates, uh, just look it over before we go. He's like, "Oh, you have you're missing all these things," oh, and I'm like, "Well, well, can't I mean, and, you know, the the FedEx is in Apple Valley from us, so that's like 20 minute yeah. drive." Yeah, and I'm like, uh, "Can you just print them out here?" No, I can't. <laughs> nah, dog. Like, okay, so he's like, "You need <laughs> this one. You you have this one like invoice thing. You need four copies. Like, why would you need four copies?" I'm sending a hockey card to Canada. It's like, I'm not like smuggling ballistic missiles, uh, you know? Yeah. I just, so I'm like, okay. Should have just found the guy's like, address. I'd have flown it. I could have flown it there probably by the time we figured all this out. Well, and then he goes to me and then you need another document that you should have gotten. I'm like, well, what document's that? Well, I don't really, I can't really remember what it is. I'm like, you're not that next guy. You need, to. so I go home, I print all this stuff and I go back and he's like, oh, I, uh, and it's the same guy. And he's like, he's like, you actually need this other thing too. And I'm like, okay, listen, dude, this is my, <laughs> now my second trip here. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but I'm not an international shipping expert, believe it or not. Um, uh, I really speak, you know, fluent French on podcasts is what I do. for a living. <laughs> and, and I'm like, you got to help me. I can't come back here for the third time. So he like begrudgingly yeah. decided to help me. But the long story short, and getting back to our good friend Slab yeah. Sharks here, yeah, it's just like four hours of my life. And had I lived in Canada <laughs> and I could just hand the card to them, I wouldn't have to worry about any of it. Yep. There you go. It's it's just it's an amazing relief that they have, you know, a good system and process for shipping internationally, because as we said a million times before, it's way too difficult to try to uh, it shouldn't be as hard. Our postal services need to become better friends. Yeah. Uh, remember, too, getting back to Slab Sharks, that all Connor Bedard cards have a 98% payout rate since June. So, not going to beat that anywhere else. For complete consignment information and to start consigning your cards with them today, check out slabsharks.com. Happy news! Lots of happy news. Yeah. This first story kind of blew my mind. In a good way. Really excited about this. So I found on Twitter this uh, graphic that's made by Yahoo Sports that shows current average viewership per game for each of, I guess, the five major sports leagues. If we call MLS, it's growing. I'm not trying to knock it. But it's traditionally looked at the four major sport leagues. But yeah. okay, we'll throw MLS in there. Coming in at number one, Troy, no surprise. Yeah. NFL average is 9.2 million viewers per game. That's all. That's crazy. Yeah. Number two, again, not a surprise. Uh, yeah. I think most people would guess the NBA. Huge surprise drop, though. Yeah, it's a surprise to me, though, because I don't know how anyone can watch a basketball game. Ooh, <laughs> shots that's, fired. That's me. Well, there goes our NBA podcast. <laughs> NBA is in second with 711,000 viewers per game. Big drop though from nine point two million to seven hundred thousand between number yeah. one and number two. It's like gradients, like the just between like <laughs> PSA and SGC. Yeah. But then Troy, this is where the eyebrows raise. Oh yeah. my! The NHL's third, third most watched sport in the United States yeah. right now. The National Hockey League with three hundred and ninety-eight thousand viewers per game. And you might be thinking, well, 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 what about baseball? There's more people now watching the NHL in the U.S. than Major League Baseball. Not by much. So NHL is 398,000. NHL is 378,000. But 
I can't now. What do you think? Does that say more about sort of what's going on with baseball, or more about how the NHL is actually trying to grow the game in the United States? Yeah, I don't know. I'm curious what baseball was last year because the whole rule changes. I will say I actually watched a couple games because they were so short. Now, I mean, they're still not crazy short, but when they were averaging three hours, just no one, no kid wants to watch a baseball game. I'm sorry, they're too long, and the new rules are making it faster, but. I think baseball is a fundamental problem. They got to figure out. Yeah. And if a, and the MLS was in fifth with one hundred thirty three thousand views, I, I just think that it's really important to see that the NHL is doing so well. Because if you think about how does our hobby grow, I think it makes sense that the most fertile opportunity is probably in the U.S. And Man, to see it as the third most most popular sport, yeah. I, I just see that as a good sign. And I think you can point to the NHL number one coming back to a national TV schedule. Yeah. And because it, we have weekly games on ESPN and TNT, uh, that's a big, we talked about, I think especially TNT has done a great job mirroring the yeah. success of inside the NBA that has, you know, Shaq and Chuck and Kenny Smith and uh, Eddie Johnson, but with Bissonette, and Wayne Gretzky and Henrik Lundqvist. Uh, it, it's an interesting broadcast to watch. It keeps you hooked and into the games. Um, the other thing, though, that, again, you point back to, as amazing as it is that there's more viewers in hockey than baseball, the total hockey viewership is 4% of the yeah. NFL viewership. Yeah, so NFL if that speaks to one. room to grow, then... Yeah. Okay, I have, a, I have a tangent topic to this, and it's, it's relevant to the last couple of days. Did you notice that there was like three days there was zero NHL games? I did because I was setting my fantasy lineup, and I'm like, why does none of my guys play for the, like three days in a row? And that's how I knew there was no games. But did you have the TV on where every channel is either an yep. NFL game or an NBA game? Why? I, I'm sure the players love it. Yeah, I, I have to believe this was a player's thing, like something in the new bar- collective bargaining agreement where they're like, we want a three-day vacation during Christmas. I, I, It had to be that, right? Because any child in their right mind wouldn't do this, would they? <laughs> I don't know. It's dumb. I, I, well, look at like LeBron James has probably played every Christmas day, and he's a billionaire or whatever he is. He has yeah. more leverage and right to have that mindset you just talked about. But I think he gets the importance of this you're just sitting around with family and you're trying to avoid them. And so you're flicking through the TV <laughs> and why not have a hockey game to watch? I just, I just think that they, they got to fix that. It's such a, a, a big missed opportunity in my mind. Yeah. Three days without a game is kind of crazy. Uh, you know, I guess at, at this juncture of the season, but yeah. Okay. We'll move on to the next story, Troy. So, a little under the radar, it feels, but the World Junior Championship is underway. Yep. yep. In Gothenburg, Sweden. Is this where you tell us you played there? I've played in Sweden. I didn't play in Gothenburg, though. Okay. Uh, I would make an argument it's a big tournament in the hobby. Is it yep. kind of create a lot of hype and momentum for draft eligible players? Look at the hype Mason McTavish got uh, uh, the World Junior Championships, was it <laughs> one or two years ago? No. Yep. 10 teams total in this year's tournament. Group A is Canada, Sweden, Finland, Germany, and Latvia. Group B is Czechia, our United States of America, Slovakia, Switzerland, and Norway. I kind of feel like we got the easy group. <laughs> I mean, Canada, Sweden, Finland, and Germany, and Latvia is, I don't know how good Latvia is, but that's a pretty tough pairing there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Are we in like the, the kids group or something like that? No idea. I don't know. I didn't check today, but yesterday, USA, Canada, Slovakia, and Sweden won their opening games. And if you're looking for, like, who are some notable, maybe, hobby prospects to follow? So, in Canada, you have Owen Beck, Matthew Patois, Macklin Celebrini, Matthew Savoy. <laughs> USA has Will Smith, uh, Cutter Gauthier. Got to mention <laughs> our guy, too. I think he had a go- two goals, maybe, in the first game. Uh, Jimmy Snuggerud from the Golden Gophers. Yep. And then, try when I was looking at the USA squad, I noticed that David Lasande or Lasande 
Mm. Is the team USA goalie coach? You gonna go after that job? You gonna take take him down or what? <laughs> I am not that guy. David Lassonde's been around forever. He's been like Wisconsin, Dartmouth, Providence. I think he's been he's been every he's been everywhere. He's a good coach. You're David Lasan fan? You I'm a his, David like, Lasan fan. Yep. You gonna get his like rookie coach card autograph? <laughs> or no. Now, I, when it comes to the European teams, it's so hard because. They don't play like in juniors, and they just don't get as much exposure. So there wasn't uh, many names that stood out. But I was looking yeah. at the Sweden roster, Troy, and in Sweden, there's uh, you may not have noticed, but Elias Pedersen plays for Sweden. <laughs> I feel I like Elias Pedersen's a very common name. I feel like there's like one out of every five people in Sweden and males is really? Elias is Pedersen. It, is it like Jack Smith here in the United States? <laughs> yeah. or like Tom Johnson or something? Yeah, like Tom that? Johnson. Uh, exact same spelling so that won't be who's that like oh there's like there's two sebastian ajos in the nhl right yeah, <laughs> yeah. nicholas Kinda baxter's nice. at one point too but no the, the wild guy's gone then the only other guy i recognize on sweden is uh liam ogren who's their captain yeah uh wild prospect that's why i know i think our high draft pick from a couple years ago a leader troy he's captain that's a good sign huh yep i like it but if you're watching or listening from other countries or even the U.S., Sweden or Canada, and there's other studs that we should all be knowing about uh, or tracking, uh, be sure to comment or message us. And it looks like if you're in the United States as well, the NHL Network is going to be your best bet to watch games. I'm sure they're all over the TV in Canada. And, and I think like yeah. this is like where you now we just kind of sung the praises of the NHL gaining momentum and TV viewership here in the U.S., I don't think there's hardly any steam for this tournament here where I'm assuming it's a much bigger deal in Canada. Yeah. It's, it seems like it doesn't get a lot of traction in the U S and then also, also next or in two weeks or a week, two weeks, the women's U 18 world championships begin. And of course we lose three of our players from Tonka for four games as they go off over the globe. To, I think they're in Switzerland. So we'll lose our, our one of our goalies. And a defenseman and a forward. Okay. There we go. Well, we're going to find out how good of a coach you're after me. <laughs> I got some quick hitters. So uh, you must have seen this because I think it was yeah, everywhere. I uh, saw this. Uh, during the San Antonio Spurs recent trip to Chicago to take on the Bulls, a young French and very tall NBA rookie Victor <laughs> Wembenyama had the opportunity to meet our guy, Craig Connor Bedard. Yep. Sometimes a picture really is worth a thousand words. It's <laughs> one of the more amazing pictures that that you will see. The, the two talented rookies swapped jerseys and stood next to each other, holding up the you know the respective jersey of the yep. other player. I what well, do you think that Bedard even comes up to his like belly button? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's like right in the middle of his chest. It's crazy how much more taller <laughs> Web and Yama is, and Web and Yama's. Jersey is a legit dress. On yeah, Connor it Bedard. is. Like it is. it's, it, it's like a church dress because it like goes <laughs> like below your knees, too. Um, Wemmy Yamatroy is seven foot four, compared to Bedard, who is measured in officially at like five nine and three quarters. <laughs> um, I don't know. I question that even now yeah. looking at at this photo. And of course, this isn't a Mashro Troy, but that makes Wemmy Yama a full foot and a half taller than Connor Bedard. <laughs> And then I don't know if you saw too. There's a video that showed Bedard teaching oh, Wemby how to shoot yeah. pucks, yeah, like I it was did. like in a dry land facility or something like that. Uh, the stick that Wemby, I don't think, literally <laughs> came up to his sternum. You know, it's supposed to like come up to like above your nose or whatever yeah. when you're in, in shoes. Uh, he, he was getting it. Those first few shots were terrible, but uh, Bedard taught him well. Fun to see them together. Good for hockey to cross promote. And again, I think it's another. For, or thing to point out that the NHL is actively trying to make this kid a star. Yep. And by some miracle, it, they're doing a decent job of it. So I guess you got to give them credit for that. Kind of staying on the uh, Bedard theme. Uh, did you know that a uh, Michigan goal is now part of his repertoire? Right? I did. I saw this. This is crazy. Okay. So I got a question first. Tangent sidebar. If we named you the official hockey lingo commissioner, 
<laughs> as your fr- and as your first official act, bro, you had to decide the name of the Michigan or lacrosse school. Which would you choose and why? I'd call Michigan just because that's the one I remember. That's when I first saw it was the Gophers versus Michigan. Of course, it was scored against the Gophers, yeah. but I would call it the Michigan. That's like if you notice, too, that every like NFL highlight that's ever shown is against the Vikings. <laughs> Of course, you're right. Of course, it was against our Golden Gopher. <laughs> I think I'd go with Michigan too. I think that's the most common. I, I, it annoys me that when you read articles, and I would be annoyed as a writer that every time they say like Michigan or lacrosse style goal. Yeah, just like, it's pick one and go with it. Yeah. So Bedard score did score the Michigan goal. Oh boy, Troy <laughs> against Jordan Bennington last Saturday. Uh, it was his 13th goal of the season. I think he's at least one more tonight, so I put him up to 14. Yep. Probably the, as a fan, the best goalie from to score that on, huh? Oh, for sure. Especially the wild. Well, wild, we don't like him because he's he's kind of I don't know. He's kind of a weenie sometimes to our players. But <laughs> when he wanted to fight, we were Flurry tried to fight him and they wouldn't let him. But I think Bennington's also the one that was on. I can't remember who they were playing, but he threw the water bottle down the hallway oh, yeah. at who, whoever was giving the interview. <laughs> oh yeah. Why, why do goalies hate getting this? Like, is this like, if you're a goalie, is this the the least, or what am I trying to say here? It's the most embarrassing kind of goal to be scored on you? Yeah, I don't know if it's that embarrassing. It's it's hard. It's hard to figure out. It's it's really skirting a line, though. I mean, because I, I can't remember the exact rule. I thought it used to be the crossbar your stick couldn't come above, but I think it's a high stick now is above your shoulders. So yeah. it gets it's really close. close to being that, but it's hard to say it was a goalie. I mean, you got to, you basically, you got to realize they're doing it at first. And that's the tough part. But once you do, you have to slam your head literally across and it has to be sticking out. So it takes away that spot or else you do the old, there's a video where this guy just comes straight across with his stick and blocker just whacks it out of the guy's, yeah. uh, out, of the, out of the stick out of the guy's. You basically got to give yourself a concussion. To yeah. stop the- it's hard. It's hard. If it, but it's hard move to pull off. But once, a lot of guys can pull it off now, so I'm sure why they all hate it is because they know it's going to be on like you're on the news. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to get like a hundred million views on social media and and such. Well, Bedard's <laughs> Michigan goal. This is a great picture, by the way. Uh, catch it, and yeah. I think you can't see real well, or maybe can that Bennington was getting some crap because his eyes were closed. Yeah, he's just but, blinking. Yeah. That's all it is. Uh, the Bedard's Michigan goal caught the attention of the great one, Wayne Gretzky, Troy, who had this to say about it. Wayne said, I couldn't do what he did tonight. <laughs> that just wasn't in my repertoire. I didn't have the right kind of curve. Hully, Bobby Hall, could do it. I could never do what he did tonight. It was fun to watch. And then Gretzky goes on to say, my daughter Emma is with me, and she goes, Dad, did you ever do that? And I said, no, I could never do that. <laughs> so that's pretty high praise yep. for... And then Bennington did share a funny TikTok afterwards titled <laughs> How to Stop a Michigan Goal that showed a really young hockey player, two yeah, really that's young hockey players. Bam, wax yeah, where he just yeah. waxed him <laughs> out of it. So that was kind of funny. But not to be outdone, Troy. Yep. On the same night, double Michigan. Double Michigan. Michigan squared. <laughs> we had Trevor Zegras also netted a Michigan goal for the Anaheim Ducks. It was his first game back after missing an extended time with injury. And actually, Troy, I found... Zegers is Michigan goal. A lot. Bedard's was impressive, but how fast Zegers was yeah. moving and that he could get the puck on a stick like that is completely mind blowing. Yeah. As much as this guy gets like ragged for a lot of stuff, his hands are <laughs> incredible. Yeah. Now, which one did you think was more impressive? I remember, I think Zegers is, I thought was more impressive, but I haven't watched the videos for a couple of days. Zegris beat Kraken goalie Joey Decord. If you remember, he's a goalie that has a sweet baseball card helmet for yep. the upcoming Winter Classic. I also found it interesting that there was this kind of narrative floating around after these two goals, comparing sort of the the fans' mindset or attitudes towards each player, where they saw it as well. Here's a wow, well, another amazing thing that Connor Bedard can do. And then with Zegris, it was just more, I think reinforcing the notion that he's all show and no go and this is all he, all he could do i don't really buy into that but <laughs> yeah, scoring a goal that and 
that's all you can do. I mean, he scored a goal, whatever. It, it is what it is. It's it's going to be a legit move for a while until they either ban it or they figure the goalies can figure it out. But I don't think – I don't see it like that. It's just two hockey plays and they both scored. I didn't verify this, but I saw a stat that like 5% of Zegers' goals are, have been Michigan goals. Oh, <laughs> that's fun. Kind of funny. And actually, I was really happy to see on the, from the Zegers front him scoring the goal because – Man, the hobby needs a little spark yeah. from him. Yeah. And uh, it was a very, very cool goal. So yeah. happy to see it from that respect. Okay. Got a couple other real quick stories. So Yarmir Yager, Troy, officially started his 36th professional season at uh, 51 years old. And nice. looking like Grizzly Adams here. <laughs> he made his season debut for his hometown team that he also owns, the yep. Colado Knights. Yep. Yeah, now and again, his 36th professional season. He didn't score in the game, but ended up, up uh, with an assist in the 4-3 loss. Plato is the team that he played for as a teenager yep. before yep. coming to the NHL, and then he uh, bought the team. But basically, at this rate, he'll never get in the Hall of Fame. This is where the NHL needs to, or it's probably not the NHL. I don't know who his actual rule, the International Hockey Hall of Fame, or what it, whoever, the Hockey Hall of Fame needs to get rid of the stupid rule for Yager and put him in, like, Really, you're gonna keep holding him out because he's playing a pro league of a team he owns and he's 51 years old. He's never gonna play in the NHL again. Just get over yourself and put him in the Hall of Fame. It's a shame he's not yeah. Hall of Fame. And then lastly, the impressive Ducks rookie Leo Carlson is gonna miss six to eight weeks. Oof. He sprained his knee last Thursday night in a three zero loss to the Calgary Flames. Here's what confuses me about this. Why do NHL teams in various, it seems like rare in certain cases, yeah, disclose the injury? I, I don't understand how these injuries get reported because, like I said, 95% of the time it'd be a lower body injury. Yeah. But and I've seen this in another case too, where they detailed exactly what the injury was. Do you know what the is it's like if they're going to be out a certain amount of time? You have to be I have no clue. I'm wondering if somehow something leaked what the actual injury was, and then they just go with it because they're like, well, we can't oh. just sit there and be like, no, nope. <laughs> it wasn't that. Something else. I don't know. I Hockey's, it's it's one of those weird things where injuries are really only given out because for gambling purposes. That's why they announce well, that, them. That's what that's I was going to say. That's totally why they announce them. I, so, I can't even believe that they can be this vague. <laughs> I know. I would think that the gambling companies or casinos or whatever yeah. you call them, are going to be have to be pushing the NHL to be more specific yeah. about that because they they do how do you place a bet when you have no idea you know you just know like the general body area that doesn't make make a lot of sense to me through twenty three games played Carlson's up to a really good start fifteen points eight goals seven assists I always hate to see injuries pop up for young hobby rookies like this but okay that's it for hobby news All we're right. going to move on Troy to our lead segment on today's show. These stories that rocked the hockey hobby in 2023. Again, as our last episode of 2023, we thought it'd be fun to look back at this year and think about what were the key hobby stories that we might actually remember three, four years from now or reference as to you know being a turning point or a significant moment in the hobby. And I think when looking back at this past year, Oh, no, this is one of the sentences. I didn't get rid of this. This is drugged up zombie Josh writing for the show. <laughs> ready? I, I'm so happy. This is what I wrote. <laughs> and when looking back at 2023, I really good remember a significant <laughs> lull in adultery. <laughs> Beautiful English. See, you can't even rip us for not knowing French or any other names because we can't even get English right. What I, what I think I meant to say is I really don't remember there being a significant lull or dull period yeah. this year. It's been like one thing after another <laughs> all year. It's always something going on in this hobby. Uh, Two, Trey, because I have no life and I've been stuck in my house. I spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to find the perfect word and I ended up picking rocked. Well, for two reasons. I, I originally thought it was shaped, but then and I had that as kind of like our working theme. Then I went back and like 10 episodes ago, we used that almost exact same terminology, which I, of course, yeah. didn't remember. So it was uh, like, oh, crap, can't use that. But then rock actually has, uh, if you look definitionally, has uh, meaning in for good things and bad things happening. So I thought that that was very appropriate.
appropriate for looking at 2023. So we're going to run through the list and give our comments on whether each of these things or occurrences maybe just felt big in the moment or which ones we think might have lasting impact. Yeah. Then we'll throw out what each of us thinks was the absolute biggest story for the hobby in 2023. One thing, quick thing to note, there aren't really in any particular order. Yeah. So again, as my beautiful mind works. So the first thing, Troy, that I pointed to was the the cup sticker autos yeah. in the 2020 21 release so the waiting and anticipation for this release was immense yeah the hobby was at a fever pitch by the time it finally came out on february 23rd 2023 it was six days shy troy of two years yeah. since the previous cup release so the 2020 2019 product the, the time in between 2019 and 2020 was almost two years exactly we had a promising rookie class highlighted, of course, by Caprisa, Jason Robertson, Timmy Stutzla, Jake Ottinger, Ilya Sorokin, Dylan Cousins, all these people. Then the sticker bombshell drops on release day as the first Caprisa and Sorokin cards were pulled, yep. for which we, lead, we later found out by having Upper Deck on the show that the two Russian players were not going to sign. And it was really a matter of having them, according you know, per, per Upper Deck, having them autos in the product or not. Um, or I guess maybe unsigned cards yeah. for Caprice Off and Sorokin. Now, there's a couple of things that kind of wrinkled a number of, of collectors in the hobby. Uh, the first thing was that the cup preview images, there was cards like, I'll show you this Caprice Off monumental patch that's yeah. still on the sell sheets today that uh, kind of, I think, much more indicates a hard signed auto yeah. than a sticker auto. Yeah. So, you know, some people felt that that maybe was a tad bit misleading and i don't think upper deck was trying to pull a fast one on anyone you know there's a lot of people that work on these you have artists that do these previews they who knows when it was found out that kaprizov and sorokin were going to be sticker autos and maybe it was just not kind of double checking yeah that, that caused it but anyway you're, everyone's gonna have their own opinion yeah on that uh, i understand that I don't know, Trey. I feel like this one was, and especially basically what's happened since then, was a huge story in the moment. Yeah. But with all the continued rookie auto issues and products since then, which we'll talk about in a minute, and even having like the Zegris sticker auto being in the most recent cup that came out last week, I feel like we're being a little bit conditioned to it. Yep. Like, are we hobby sheep now? Uh, you know, it, it's like people were so up in arms, and I didn't feel like anyone batted an eye. Uh, on the 20th of this month when it was like, oh, yeah, there's, there's Zegra stickers in the cup. Yeah, if, if it keeps happening, guess what? We're all just going to get conditioned to it. Now, I will be one of those like Mitch Grotman. I, I really agree with him that this is your highest end product. I understand they weren't going to sign. I get it. However, this is your highest end product. I don't want sticker autos in this. I just don't. So I don't know how you figure it out. But if, if they like this, the current release had what a couple were stickers. Like Zegris, I think right? Just Zegris. Okay, That's Zegris. What I know. But if it keeps happening, we're going to get conditioned to it. And I guess what? It's just we're going to move on, probably. I, I don't think it will be. I mean, people will complain every year, but unless we stop buying the cup, then I don't know if anything will happen about it. I mean, I guess. I mean, I, mean, I know Upper Deck doesn't want this. They don't want to have sticker autos. Of course but, not. You know, with all the legalities and all the stuff going on yeah. with contracts, it might just be a thing that we're going to have to deal with. Well, that's a really good segue into our next sort of event that or big thing that happened in the hobby in this past year. And yeah. it's multiple sets with rookie auto issues. Yeah. Uh, Upper Deck has been having issues with lots of recent releases. And, and I'll say, though, that them having issues with certain rookies and their auto rights is not anything particularly new. No. Most savvy collectors know that, like, and I'll just mention a couple, like, there's David Posternock in 2014. We had sticker autos in the cup. There's Jack Eichel in 2015, who I think had signed to Leaf or uh, some other company and didn't have autos in the cup and later had updates as Mitch went through in subsequent releases. But I think what makes this year stand out in particular with this issue is the amount of issues. It's yeah. like they've been everywhere, it seems like, for the past six months. And it's kind of odd to have a product where there aren't rookie auto issues now versus being surprised on the rare occasions where where there are 
Do we have both the last two cup releases with stickers with Kaprizov, Sorokin, and Zegras? 22, 20, 2021, 22 stature was missing autos for the big yeah. rookies like Cole Caulfield. Now they added them later through achievements, but I don't know. Yeah. Then we had credentials. I was really excited for credentials. Yeah. I love the debut ticket access rookie autos. Really a, a big time card that I love. Every top rookie was missing. Yeah. From that from that product and, and are not going to be there. And that is a rookie auto driven product yep. without the best rookies. So it's, it's, you can get it for like 40, 50 bucks. Now it was $150 on release because nobody wants it. Yeah. Right. We had stickers and ultimate another set that shouldn't have uh sticker autos. And I, I'm sure there's one or two other sets that I forgot as well. And you can chime in, Troy, if you remember them. Um, but when it comes out like, okay, why is this happening? Or should we blame somebody for this? I don't know where to point the finger, Troy. Is there some like fundamental change that Upper Deck has made to their auto agreements where some athletes are just not buying it anymore? Yeah, it's weird. I don't know. Like, I would love, oh my God, I would love to have someone come on and talk about these agreements and the legalities because yeah. to protect your brand some way, somehow you got to fight this or something. I don't know how you do it, but... The NHL, the NHLPA, and Upper Deck, or whoever holds license has to get together and just be like, we can't have this. All it does is make everyone mad. There's nothing yeah. good that comes from nobody sticker wins. autos. Yeah, nobody wins with sticker autos. A lot of people think it might be fanatics stirring the pot, right? Trying to do exclusive deals with these guys. Uh, or it might just be a young generation of stars that don't want to sign as much. Yeah. You know, remember too, we've gotten a number of tidbits from guests. Yeah, we've been, you're right. It would be awesome to have somebody on to kind of lay this out for us in very broad and detailed and understandable terms. But we've heard tidbits here and there that talk about how um, they have to sign tens of thousands of times, which would yep. suck. Let's just admit that. And they get paid peanuts. Yeah, it's not a lot so, compared to the other sports. So does that to a 20 year old does that sound appealing probably not so maybe they just hit a point where they're like i'm done i don't want to yeah. do it anymore i don't know and it, i think the long-term question is very similar to what we talked about like in the cup is this the new normal mm -hmm. right that we shall get used to or will we look at 2023 as just kind of like a blip in the radar a messy year for ricky autos but then things got normalized sort of again do you have an opinion of that do you have a i, guess I think it's what? a new no i think it's a new normal I think we're just going to go forward with it. And as much as they're going to try maybe not to do it, I think it's going to happen and we're just going to have to live with it. I hope that's not the case. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's not the new normal, but I feel like I'm just being overly optimistic too. So I don't know. All right. Well, the first two kind of mild big things that happened this year, we're a little on the negative side, get that. Yep. So let's kind of switch over to the positive, much happier story. And that's a SB signature edition legends. Yeah. Now, this set Troy released on March 8th and has basically been an immediate success. Yes. I, I might even say the set of the year. Yep. It's, it's, you'd have to be up there on almost everybody's list, I would yeah. think. Yeah, agree. And as much a, a, a times as we fairly criticized Upper Deck, I think they deserve a huge amount of credit and kudos for knocking this one out of the park in my Yep. Day. I assume you agree with that. Agree with that 100%. Plus, it just gets me excited of what's to come in this kind of vein of these maybe legendary sets or because we know this is kind of a one-off or, and I just, I'm so excited for what else is going to come out in this kind of vein. Yeah. And this theme. Yeah. In fact, Troy, it's a set so nice. You can never say the same name. Twice. <laughs> I can't. <I> just, <laughs> is it just me? So it's not just me that does that. No, it's all of us. One time I'll be like SB legend signature edition. And then I'll be SB signature <laughs> edition legends. I, I can never keep them straight. Yeah. Confuses the crap out of me. Uh, it's because I'm dumb. But if I had <laughs> one complaint, and it's the teeniest, tiniest, stupidest complaint, it's that the name is too long and confusing. But I can like I it. have like these cards just sit like I've shown these before. I got my Jill Malashes. Yeah, I just have these sitting out because I'm I'm gonna put them in cases. And, like I have these cards all over the place. I love them so much, and <laughs> I want to put them in display cases. The big chase card, of course, is the all-time Future Watch autos. A much lower serial number in print runs than. The traditional Future Watch Auto out of nine ninety nine. Uh, I give an example here of the Wayne Gretzky that we're showing on YouTube. Uh, what an amazing card! That's yeah, awesome. Uh, the concept is fantastic. The set design is awesome. It gave. Uh, here's what I love about the set too: is it gave Upper Deck and the hobby 
the opportunity to really directly shine the spotlight on legendary players. It's not just like, here's like the six legendary players in the cup. Yeah. It's, this is all legends. You can learn about these guys. Uh, we can they have hobby chase that can maybe increase the popularity of some of their playing yep. days cards and so on and so forth. Having two autos per box was a brilliant move. Yep. Makes that, I think a really good value in my mind. I'm sure harder for them to get all the val- autos in. And you could tell just how popular it's been because in the past few months, since it came yep. out, it's been super hard to find. Yeah. We went to the expo, the expo in November. Yeah. yeah. I was like, thinking about the expo. Who, maybe one table had it, a couple tables. I don't know. I don't, I, think I never our, saw it. Did you see it? I think like, I never saw it, but I know, I think one of our, I can't remember if Dave, David found yeah. one, if I remember right. I can't remember. Oh, California right. Dave? Yeah, California Dave. I think he found one. Gosh. <laughs> I think that the, the concept has legs and I'm most happy that Upper Deck knows they can't do another. They they can't just yeah. come out with signature <laughs> edition legends part two. Part two. Right. They have to find another way. Like yeah. uh, one person suggested last week, I'm sorry if I don't remember who it was, that maybe it'd be like an OPG platinum themed legends product, which would be pretty awesome. Yeah. But yeah, I just uh, really love that that this product came out. And last week, Billy Celio or the week before, I guess did confirm that they're working on another concept that's very similar. So what if it had been very like the cup, that. the cup legends edition? Wouldn't that be awesome? Like Jill's Melage patch autos and all these crazy. I don't know, it'd be probably yeah. impossible to do that. <laughs> Find all the jerseys and everything you'd need, but oh I can hope. I can wish. That'd be sweet. So I'm curious if if do you think that the that this set kind of deserves being one of the most mentioned kind of oh, big easily. things in the hobby this yep. year? Okay. Easily. Okay, gotta talk about another set though, in a little bit of a different way. Ooh. I think the next big story <laughs> is the OPG Platinum centering issues. Yeah. And Troy, overall, it's been a magical like two plus year run for OPG Platinum yep. cards. The size yep. of a gold out of 50 is still one of the most bankable and chase cards that we have in the hobby. And similarly to the cup, there's been a, there's a long waiting period between 2020 OPG Platinum and then the 2021 release. Yeah. So 2020 Platinum came out on November 10th, 2021. Whereas 2021 Platinum was released on June 21st, 2023. 19 months yep. in between releases. Plus you have the 2021 Hobby Class being fairly strong and... You know, it, we're right in the middle when this comes out and the Cole Caulfield run. So there's a ton of excitement for the product. We were really pumped about it yep. and definitely had circled it on the calendar for us. And then it comes out, Troy. And on, I really struggle here because I don't want to over dramatize it or overblow it. But it seems like on a pretty, and you, so you correct me if you think I'm stepping too far across the line. I think on a pretty big scale, the centering was awful. Well, um, every I think almost when it came out in our Discord, we had a lot of people, like a lot of members, post their boxes, and every box had some kind of issue. Not every card, but there was issues on a lot of cards. And a lot and of that, the big hits, yeah, the big the hits is where the problem is. Yeah, I agree. So it was like really quickly, like the all the air just came right out of the blue. Yep. And. And I was thinking about this, I think, yesterday, too. And it hit me that I want to get your see if you agree with me or not. But I don't remember a product that had this much hype that whose momentum died as fast as 2021 Platinum did. Yeah, it did die pretty quick. It maybe it was maybe like over credentials when it found yeah. out we didn't have any of the big rookies. <laughs> that, that but but, but credentials is quick. nowhere near the, yeah. as the esteem of Platinum either. Agree. agree. And when you think about it, when this came out, the suggested retail price is 200 US a box. At yep. release basically, yep. it's hard enough it to yeah. open any $200 box and break even. But when you get a nice Cole Caulfield hit, like the one we're showing on YouTube, and it's got like 90 10 centering or 80 20, it makes 10... you sour on the product real fast. Yeah, it's at 104, or I'm finding prices like 15 to 1. Wow. 130. Well, that's the I don't know if those sites count. Here's Dave. David Adams says it's at 150. So that's actually better than I thought it would be. I still wouldn't with the centering issues. I don't think yeah. I'd pay that. Nope. Uh, I as much as I love the product. 
and I, I want to say too, we don't expect perfect centering on every no. card. Like we get no. the whole centering game in the hobby, but I think this was um, egregious yeah. is maybe the word I'll, I'll use. So I don't know, Trey, I'm not sure this that this will be like a lasting hobby story that we'll be talking no. about 2021 centering from years. But here's what I do wonder, though, is that and I, I haven't taken the time to like do a whole study on all the platinum values of even past sets, but do you think it's kind of taken the steam out of the platinum momentum a little bit or? Well, it definitely took it out of this no. release, but I, th- I think, I think, I think it's going to be corrected. I hope they really focus on it next time. And I think a lot of people will just be, give this the one off treatment. Like, yep, it happened. If they do fix it, then it will be back to where it was and we'll be all excited for it. If they don't, if this is second year, a second year in a row where it's really bad centering, that's going to be a problem. Well, the next release though is the 2022 hobby class. So it's oh god, so it's not a big one. Yeah, not a big one there, too. All right, we're gonna move on to the next big story that we thought helped, you know, rocked the hobby this season. And it's Connor Bedard Mania Troy. I'm not sure there's been a bigger force or larger figure in the hobby this year than the young Connor Bedard, of course. Uh, such a large figure for a relatively short guy. Uh, whether it's because he's the first generational talent to come in the social media age or skills are just that compelling, there's been zero precedence, zero, in the hobby yeah. for how his pre-NHL cards and early NHL cards, for that matter, have performed in the secondary markets and how have been as hyped or chased as, as Connor Bedard. So I have a few data points here that I think are interesting. We're just a couple days left in 2023. So, so far this year, 12,814 Connor Bedard cards have sold in the secondary markets per card letter sales history. Remember, too, of those 12,814, very few are NHL cards. Yeah. As a point of context, in the same time period, so basically year to date, 4,145 Nathan McKinnon cards have sold on the secondary markets. And he might win the Hart Trophy <laughs> this season. His, and plus, his, his cards start come on 2013, so there's literally thousands more cards of Nathan McKinnon. Bedard has 13 career goals, or 14 now, I guess, at least. And our, it's already has four cards that have sold for more than $10,000. And honestly, it's going to keep climbing. Yeah. yeah. We just did that that post about a the $10,000 Series 1 Easter egg, yeah. PSA 10. Uh, a couple of days later, a card beat it by a few hundred dollars, but so for everyone saying that there's no way this is possible, well, now there's two that have sold for more than 10 grand, and who knows where it goes from here. Uh, there's 14 MVP redemptions that have sold for more than $1,000. MVP! Yep. Right? Now, ultimately, Bernard landed in the perfect place. Might not be the perfect team, because this team's not very good, but the market is ideal for the NHL to expose them to the masses and really make him kind of a face of the game. And for once, as we mentioned earlier, too, it looks like the league's not going to mess it up. I feel like, too, Troy, Bedard has the mentality to handle all the pressure and and does have the skills to be a a superstar. I mean, one, people knock his skating a little bit, but maybe that'll improve. Maybe it won't. And the big thing is probably going to be health. Can you stay healthy and and producing? But uh, I I don't know. I, I go back to if anything's dominated the hobby in 2023, it's Connor Bedard. And I'm kind of curious, five years from now, what do you think you'll remember about the Bedarda Palooza of 2023? How stupid overpriced his redemptions were. <laughs> I don't know. I I will remember, you know what I'm going to remember? The short print that was not a short print. That's probably what I'll remember, how this card was called a short print, and now it's just everywhere. Seems yeah. like there's a lot of them out there. I'll remember that. I think that I do. I, I think the redemptions will probably. I'm so curious what those end up for in five years. How much those are going for? The actual card versus the redemption, but and then our card there. That's what I'll remember. It's the only athlete in the entire world that has like a pandemic level like yeah. hobby market. Yep. Right where it says everything's astronomical, nothing makes sense. Imagine if he did come out during the the pandemic hobby boom. <laughs> how even more exaggerated everything might be. Well, the next kind of couple of big stories are pretty tangential to Bedard. Yeah. And we got to roll into the Series 2 presale pricing and drama that has ensued. 
obviously the series two will include the Connor Bedard Young Guns, so that's kind of the big tie in there. Currently, Troy is sitting about three hundred US per hobby box, so it looks like series two will easily and by far be the most yep. expensive flagship box ever. Here in the US, pre-sales started about 150 US, I think even less in Canada, and quickly sold out. Then they jumped to 200 and have kept going up since, and they've been pretty stable for the last couple of months at 300. Yeah. There's been a little bit of interesting. We've had drama with Dave and Adams because they kept sending out emails saying, now we're never, you'll never get a chance <laughs> to buy these, and then they sell out. And then 13 minutes later, they're, they're restocked for $50 more. So, yeah. you know, that was kind of annoying and funny to watch at the same time. Then more recently, we had the whole Klaus and Chara kerfuffle where they reduced paid for pre-orders by 50% because according to them, they had miscalculated their allocation. Still the only ones we've heard about yeah. that somehow got their allocations cut. I don't know what happened to everyone else, but. And, and like as a, well, maybe a hockey hobby podcast or just general collectors or consumers, watching this whole thing has been a trip. Okay. I mean, it reeks of almost no planning or coordination in the industry uh, of any kind whatsoever. Now, I don't know if you blame distributors or online retailers, Upper Deck or Card Shop, who knows? It's like everything's being decided, Troy, like at the spur <laughs> of a moment with yeah. with the greed button turned up to 11, if you yeah. want a Spinal Tap reference. I, I It's like, and it's, he, Bedard didn't come out of nowhere. They had years to plan this. Yep. And show me the evidence that there's any planning of how <laughs> that this was going to be, his cards are going to be distributed to the hobby in a winning fashion. Yeah. Now maybe they couldn't have anticipated the crazy demand, but you should have had a contingency plan around that. Like if you're like demand planning, like in a real way, right? I just um blows my mind. Now remember, if you compare the flagship release for McDavid, right? So if you look at the flagship product that came out direct right before his the one with his young guns, which would have been 2020, 2015 series one. So you'd have to go back to 2014 Series 2. And you compare the release pricing, there's about a 35% increase. It's going to double yeah. with Connor Bedard. So Series 1, 150. Series 2, 300 plus. At least double. Right? It, it's just, again, it's another one. There's no comparisons ever, ever for this. And I, and I really think, too, and we talked about this before, that these prices this high in series two are going to have an overall negative impact on the hobby. I think that card shops and upper deck and distributors are going to sell less products as a result because nobody's buying anything nope. else. Nope. Right. It, it, instead of like high tide raising all ships, this is like the anchor that's dragging the hobby, the, the say wax sales down right now. Uh, I just bought, I didn't even tell you this because we snatched up some SP legends because they showed up on Dave and Adams. I threw a box of a synergy for us in there, Troy, because it was 40 bucks a box for 2021. Jeez. Wow. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Right. So, so I don't know. What do you think that are you confident that the price is stabilized on this or do you expect it to be more on release day? And then what do you think the lasting hobby impact of all this is going to be? I don't know. I think it's going to stay at 300 until release. And then unless, unless Bedard goes crazy in the next month and scores about 20 goals i think the price is pretty much settled in i don't know what the impact will be long term i think i know it's in the short term it's ticked a lot of people off the whole process and what's happened with pre-orders being cut at whatever calls and chara but i think it's shown that i don't and like you said I, i'm not really know who to who to blame but the greed aspect seemed really to hurt a lot of people and left a sour taste in their mouths, but we'll see what happens when it's released, how it goes. But for now, I think I right now, I think it's a ticked off a lot of people. Well, series one next year can't be 300 bucks, right? No, it can't be. No way. Now, the it one really thing does. though, that I did think about, and this is like a little mini aha moment I had, it was based off of the comments you were making a couple of shows ago about the growth of the college game. So the college players that play in college because they tend to sign their entry level contracts and then play the what five to 10 game stint in the NHL in the spring. That makes Ooh. it them candidates for series one, where if you play in the CHL and have to wait to get drafted yeah. that summer, 
then you're a series two guy and think about it you have macklin salabrini yep. in college you have will smith in college or Gauthier in college so there could be a whole you know the 2024 25 crop could be pretty decent I, I don't know when all their draft eligibility is or if they'll end up playing college more but uh, just the whole notion about how you know college is getting you know more popular option yep. for these guys i think could get us seeing more of the top guys back in series one another huge uh story was the flagship configuration changes that we had yep. uh the most significant changes in the flagship products and uh, way more than a decade maybe two decades even and then as part of the configuration changes some new young guns parallels as well that were introduced in series one of this year. So 2023, 24, they were not small changes either, Troy, pretty big ones, it's significant ones. So flagship boxes have traditionally had 24 packs with eight cards and one hit per pack. They moved it to 12 packs with 12 cards now with three hits. So in each new hobby box, you're going to get 60 less base cards, but you get 12 more hits. As a part of this upper deck, also sunsetted a few existing Young Guns parallels. They sunsetted the French variation, clear cut exclusives, which is really rare and hard to hit, anyways. They did add, though, four new parallels with three being numbered for both base and Young Guns, but hey, we mainly care about the Young Guns. So added was the Young Guns Deluxe out of 250 as a parallel, kind of in the, along the same theme of exclusives and high gloss. Then they added the new Outburst Parallels that have had their own unique design characteristics. You have Outburst Silver, which is not numbered, kind of essentially replaced French uh, variation as far as rarity and what their pack odds are. Outburst Red out of 25, and then Outburst Gold 101. So we have a Young Guns 101 just in time for Connor Bedard Troy. Uh, I think the overall changes have been, we've talked about this a little bit too, have been received very positively in the hobby, and I know we've been very complimentary of them as well. Yeah, now, I, I was going to say, I think it's been a, a hit. So yeah. good job, Upper Deck. Keep doing it going forward. I think maybe the only people that are a little bummed are set builders. I don't know how many yeah. of those guys are left. Maybe more than we think, but if you're going to get 60 less base cards in your box, you're going to have to yeah. buy a lot more boxes to kind of build that set. Yeah, I agree. Upper Deck's done a pretty good job with this. If you think about it, too, it, what a disaster it would have been if they if it wasn't a hit. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> like if the changes were not received very well, I, and we might have brought this up a couple shows ago, but I think it's worth repeating that to me, the last, I have two potential lasting questions with the new configuration. Will it was the young guns deluxe two hundred and fifty necessary. Will it yeah. be a lasting chase card? Will the value be commensurate with the other kind of serial numbered young guns? Um, I, but I don't know. Maybe the, the flip side of that is look how much people spend for base young guns. Yeah. So you think they're not going to chase out of 250, which would be a good argument. And then I'm kind of going to be really curious to see how the outburst designs change over time. Is it going to kind of all look the same, have the same kind of foiling in the background? Or will they, like with the young guns design, kind of switch them up every year? But uh, I don't know. I, I think I thought this was definitely worthy of one of the bigger stories of the year. Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah, 100%. All right, we got two more left. Then we have to pick, for us, the biggest story. So it, I think you can't mention big stories of the year without talking about the general market decline or card value uh, decline. And there's very few and imperfect ways to measure hobby health when it comes to values. And you know, and there's lots of other things other than value to measure hobby health, too. But people care about values the most, it seems like. Where these indexes like card ladder or market movers to track or you track card show prices or just monitor your own collection, there's no doubt that prices have fallen this year. Looking at like Card Ladder's hockey index, the market's down 15% year to date. Market Movers has a number of indexes. They're down a little bit. We're doing a little bit worse year to date, like in the negative 20, negative 30%. And we've talked about it before. These indexes are very far from, from perfect, but they do give you a sense, right? I mean, just because they're not perfect doesn't mean that directionally they don't point to uh, maybe it's not the exact number, but it shows that the you know that the hobby is going up or down, at least. And as such as hockey, of course, all sports have taken a hit in 2023. So the tricky part to all this, Troy, in my mind, is what does it mean, right? Is the 
decline of prices tied to the general economy where we've seen worry and big inflation there's a lot of global instability could that impact how people buy you know spend their discretionary money or is it just a correction from the pandemic pricing boom you know i don't know if there's uh, probably no way to really know what you think i think it's everything combined into one one big pot (laughs) and just this is the perfect time that it's hit And then I think it's even harder to predict now what's going to happen going forward, right? And honestly, nobody can predict anything. So it's like if you if somebody could predict uh, any market's going to go up or down, they would be a billionaire sitting on yep. a six hundred foot yacht somewhere. So, but then again, though, I think the flip side of this is so if you only looked at the numbers, you'd think the hobby is like dying, right? In horrible yep. shape, doom and gloom. Everybody's sad, but there's a lot of other indicators that are tangible that speak otherwise. One of them will point to right away is we know the volume of cards sold is just as strong, if not stronger than last year. So more cards are being bought and sold just for less money. That, that's not great pricing news, of course, but it does point to an, an engaged hobby that still cares and wants to transact and trade. And then you go to like shows like the National or the Expo. And if that was your only vantage point, like if you never saw values or prices or these indexes, whether you believe in them or not, you would think the hobby is like on fire. Went to the expo. <laughs> like it was the best year ever in the hobby because so many people, so much fun, so many people that are positive, lots of trading and transacting going on there, there too. So yeah, I don't know. You, I look back at like the pandemic and the whole, what they say about the last dance documentary and how that really kicked off the basketball market and everything kind of followed. Do you remember the big crazy poker Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was like what 15 years ago now, maybe. Yeah, when Something it became like big online, like poker oh. stars and party poker, and all those were everywhere. Everybody was playing poker all the time, <laughs> right? You're getting together at friends' houses, everyone was watching the World Series of Poker. Yeah, there's a like Chris Moneymaker guy, right? Who yep. won like a bunch of money, and so it had its like two year run like that, where it was just bigger than big, and then it kind of died down, and it's still obviously popular, but never quite the same. I don't know if that's maybe the trajectory of what well, we'll look at, like maybe like the pandemic boom, if if 10 years from now, if the sports car market will be the same. But but I do think there's some differences, though, in this stupid analogy. You have yeah. new players that come into the hobby all the time, like Bedard and Wembenyama, that create more interest, right? Where poker is kind of just poker. Yeah. And uh, And then we have like Fanatics, who's trying to take collecting to the mainstream. There's Tom Brady baseball card commercials on national TV for gosh sakes, right? Yep. When did we see baseball card commercials ever? On <laughs> um, and again, as tough as the future will always be to figure out, we know value struggled this year and say what you want about caring about it. it it's not as fun. When It's more fun when everybody's cards are going up. But I don't know. How, how do you look at the market slide in the hobby this year, Troy? You're on mute. Again, I'm on mute. Um, I'm not that worried about it. And again, I'm not that. I know I should be interested in it from a standpoint of what's going on, but it doesn't really affect me that much. So I yeah. just kind of see it in the periphery. And I guess, you know, in, in a way it's worrisome, but I feel like it's just everything kind of converged. And now we're in a down market trend. Hey, it happens all the time. If you have a 401k, if you have a retirement plan, guess what? It's going to go up and down, up and down, up and down. The best thing is never look at the values. And just wait till the end when you need it. So that's that's kind of how I look at it. All right, the last big story that we think had a bit had an impact this year. By far the best picture of this whole yeah, thing. The, the Ovechkin <laughs> roller coaster. You like that? I love that. Had to get Ovi on the roller coaster there. So it's kind of wild when you think about the calendar year of 2023 with Ovi. Yeah. So in 2023, Troy, we've seen him finish a season with 42 <laughs> goals and 75 yep. points. Last spring at 37 years old. Then this fall, the 38-year-old version of Ovi looks like he <laughs> fell off a cliff. Yeah. Right? Through 31 games, he has six goals and 20 points. His 2023-24 pace is at about 16 goals right now for the season. Right? He has 828 career goals. needs 67 to break Gretzky's record. If he scores 16 goals a year, he's going to be like well into his 40s yeah. at the time he he breaks the record. And it, I, who knows if he'll even be able to play 
that long. So the drop off in production has been dramatic in a very short period of time. And we've talked about this issue quite a bit in recent weeks and the potential reasons as to why. Uh, and there's even reasons you could still be optimistic, like people point out his very, very low shooting percentage mm-hmm. that can only go up, right? I just don't think anyone was forecasting this. No. Like this big of a drop off. And then to boot, you have his like perennial nemesis or uh, <laughs> right companion comparative Sidney Crosby, <laughs> who is like having an amazing season that I don't think anyone predicted either, right? No. Um, it's made and as a result, some of the hobby's greatest thinkers like Troy are starting to question where OV will even get there <laughs> at all and break the goal, Gretzky goal record at this point. Um, so to me, Troy, I think that that's the scenario that we remember in 2023 regarding OV and the goal chase. If he never got there, that we're this is when he fell off the cliff. Like, the, yeah, you know, I don't think we'll remember this if he all of a sudden ends this year with 35 goals and is back to his normal self next year. It'll be forgotten about pretty, pretty quickly. And for the record, I think I'm still like 69.7% confident he's going to write the ship and get the record. But you, Troy, as of late, yeah. you're thinking what? Less than 50% at this yep. point? You're kind of yep. off the whole OV bandwagon. Yep, I'm thinking less than 50% for sure. And it just keeps dropping by a percentage each day. <laughs> well, he finally scored, right? He did score yeah. a goal in the last couple of days. It wasn't an empty netter either. No, it wasn't an no. empty netter, thank God. Do All right, well, did I forget? Those? Should they remove those from, from the records now that I think about it? Kind of. <laughs> well, did I forget anything? Is there any? The only one that just to... popped into my head, I don't know why, was the one on one population counts, the duels. Yeah, I thought about adding that. Well, I, I just don't that's know. That's my thing. Card. I, I, I just thought of it, but then I'm like, that was an issue for like a week or two. And then everyone just kind of moved on because <laughs> it's not like, I don't know if it's because other companies are having the same problems and. It was just like, oh, it's just another one yeah. of these. So, and I, I tried to pick the hockey hobby specific yeah. ones. Like, there's a whole bunch of, you know, Panini suing everybody and stuff like that, but yeah. it didn't really pertain to hobby. So, I'm going to very quickly uh, just recap by title here because there was a lot we just went through. So, we had the 2020, the cup sticker autos issue. We had then the multiple sets with rookie autos issues. Yep. SP Signature Edition Legends. OPG Platinum Centering, Connor Bedard Mania, Series 2 Presale Pricing and Drama, New Flagship Configuration, the General Market Decline that we saw this year, and then the Old Vetchkin Roller Coaster. In your mind, what was the, the one thing, if we didn't remember anything else, that we would remember about 2023? Connor Bedard Mania, because we've never seen anything like it. Yeah, I'm torn between that and the Series 2 pricing stuff. Cause, yeah, uh, I, I mean, Bedard's my one. My really close two, though, is SP Signature Edition Legends, whatever <laughs> the name of it is, because I think that's going to start something special with set releases. I think they really hit it, and I think they're going to keep using it. And I just, I, I, I'm really hopeful it's going to lead to some really cool sets coming out. If you guys think we forgot something, message us. Let us know, and we'll definitely try to add it to the conversation in subsequent shows. All right, Troy, we're going to move on to new product releases. So not a lot to talk about today, but uh, one thing I did want to bring up is I, I like to do these like really early look-ins on the yeah. secondary market. And so I thought we'd look through the top five very early uh, sales for 2021-22, the Cup. It's been out just about a week now. All right, so we'll see what cards are selling for most and which players are commanding the highest prices. Uh, we're going to start with number five, work our way down to number one. All five are eBay sales, as you'd imagine, this early on. Yeah. And I uh, just want to note that every one of these has been verified for as paid for in therapy. So we'll get right into it. Number five, Moritz Cider, an exquisite collection, rookie patch auto out of 53. So remember, with the exquisite collection RPAs are numbered out of the player's jersey. So Cider wears 53. Like in the 2019, Caleb McCarr was numbered out of eight. Uh, I think a really c- a good patch, a no. nice patch. So for 1,884 US on December 24th. So that was number, no, no, sorry. So for 1,599 on December 24th. Number four is another Merit Cider. It's a true RPA out of 99, another a decent patch. So for 1,884, this is the one I was just talking about. 
on December 24th as well. So a little bit more for the true RPA versus the exquisite RPA. If you go back and forth, though, Troy, real quick, I think if I just want the, the card that I think is the coolest, I think I'm buying the exquisite RPA. Yeah, aren't you? I would take the exquisite for sure. Now, number three, Troy, if we were bowling, it would be a Mo Turkey. Oh, Mo Turkey. You're at straight <laughs> for its cider uh, sale. With this exquisite collection, limited logos, RPA out of 50, that's over 2,850 US dollars on December 25th. I think the best patch of the three cards. Uh, one thing I don't like about the limited logos is like the teeny tiny. I like, can't stand head, that. Head, yeah. Headshot. It's like uh, uh, kids in the hall crushing your head. Yeah. It's like, I uh... Remember, too, these cards say player worn regarding the patch, but Billy Celio confirmed on our show that it was an error on the card back that they should, these are all game used card uh, patches. Yeah. Number two, Troy. Interesting card here. Sidney Crosby and owner Mario Lemieux Day with the Cup signatures card or combos. Uh, it's a dual auto, not numbered, sold for 3203 US on December 25th. I, I said it's interesting because you have Sidney Crosby, the player, and Mario Lemieux, the owner. I, yeah. I don't know how I feel about this. I can't make <laughs> up my mind. Can you? Oh, I, I would take it. I'll take it in a heartbeat. I like this card. Plus, because they're both signed on the same card, too. Yeah. Number one, not a huge shock. Cole Caulfield, true RPA out of 99. Beautiful three-color patch. Sold for 3,392 US on December 22nd. So we had three cider cards. A lot of people making a run of most cider. Maybe that's the most uh, kind of biggest shock to me so far of the top five. Yeah. Uh, he is though having kind of a decent bounce back season yep. from the sophomore for sophomore sure. last year. So maybe his market's starting to juice up a little bit. Only other notes the new product releases is just a reminder that the next hockey product out will be 2022 23 ice, uh, still slated for January 12th. Um, in addition to that, though, 2022 23 Upper Deck AHL drops today on EPAC, December 28th. So it's usually around noon Pacific. All right, Troy, it's time for a PWCC weekly preview. PWCC sponsors our show, of course. Very grateful to them. For their support, the current PWCC weekly auction is live right now. And they're actually doing a promotion with Fanatics Live, the online bidding or uh, platform, breaking mm -hmm. platform, where any bid you place in this current weekly auction will earn you a one time promo code. So you get $10 off a break spot on Fanatics Live. Mm. It's not bad. Cool. If you re recall, too, Fanatics purchased PWCC last spring. So starting to kind of tie the brands in together and yep. integrate promotions a little bit there. Uh, we've still got a couple weeks until the start of the January premiere auction. But don't worry, the weekly auctions are here. Great hockey cards, as always. And we've combed, both trying to have combed through the entirety of this week's auction and picked out our favorite vintage and modern cards to learn more about. And we're going to start with our favorite vintage cards first. Okay, so Troy, the first card I picked out is I think the wildest card <laughs> that I've ever uh, reviewed or researched. It's a 1910 C56 hockey C Toms. So C is the abbreviation. PSA 2. At PSA 2, this card is a pop of 15, or 14. So there's two things that drew me to this card. First, for early 1900s, that cobalt sweater that he's wearing. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. Is awesome. Yeah. Need to get that jersey out of my uh, uh, collection. Then I had to know what's up with like the C Toms, like the name abbreviation. Yeah. Right. The first one's not a, a huge mystery as a number of, well, first, the abbreviation is not a huge mystery because a number of players in that set actually have abbreviations. Some do, some don't. I don't understand the reason why. But so, yeah, I guess I have no news there. But to learn more about C Toms and, get, and then we'll, I guess, get into the card itself. Um, and this was a first for me on the show, Troy. I could hardly find out anything about this guy. Oh, really? There's no Wikipedia for him. The back of the card isn't a huge amount of help. Like if you switch to the to the back there, what does it oh, say? Yeah. It's like Toronto played with Cobalt in 1909. And <laughs> that's about it, hmm. right? After about honest to God, like 30 minutes of research, I found out his name is Charles. So we know Charles Toms. 
the 1910 C-56 Charles Toms PSA-2. He did play for the Cobalt Silver Kings of Cobalt, Ontario. Uh, that was a founding member of the NHL predecessor to the or NHL predecessor, the NHA, in 1909. Um, the Wikipedia entry for the team has no mention of Charles ever on their roster. But I did find like some card databases like TCDB that show that this is his rookie card. All okay. right. So now we know it's Charles Toms. It's his rookie. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was this like a great hobby conspiracy back in the day, <laughs> Troy? Like 1910 hobby drop. Yeah, no kidding. Right? Or did he just stink and nobody cared about <laughs> his cards back then anyways? I couldn't even find out what position he plays. No idea. Right? And I like I spent a legit like hour plus trying to like learn about this guy. So if yeah, anyone info weird. on Charles Tom, um, yeah, let us know. Because yeah. So it, what, end result, Troy, I think that puts this card squarely in the set builders category. <laughs> like, you know, there's 37 cards in the 1910 yeah. C56 set. Um, I don't know. Yeah, maybe there's a huge Charles Tom PC guy out there that's going to mess with us. <laughs> uh, overall, though, it's a really nice copy for a PSA 2 card. Centering is off, but it's not horrible. Yeah. Picture looks pretty clear. Color is deep and rich. Maybe a little bit of snow. In the yep. blue background, you can see kind of the white specks there. Uh, IPOY looks like a great card for PSA 2. So maybe if you are a set yeah. builder, it's one you'd want to look at. Last sale of the 1910 C56 C Tom. C Toms. Yeah. <laughs> PSA 2 was 77 US dollars in August 2020. So not a big uh, big ticket item there. All time high for PSA 2 was in the PWCC Weekly about 11 years ago. Wow. <laughs> in June 2012, when it sold for 123 US. The man, the mystery, C. Toms. You got a current bed? Well, it's going to set a record. We're at 170 U.S. right now. Somebody knows more about this guy than we do, or they're trying to complete their set. Yeah, complete their set with a low grade, which means you probably won't have to break the bank, but you might have to now. You got the next one. I do. All right, Josh. Going back. Ooh, picture kind of crazy. I did 1951. Ugh. Can't talk. 1951 Parker's Pete Babondo, number 51. It's a PSA 6. So I went back to the Parkhurst well again. And again, what jumped out at, at jumped out at me. One kind of the picture jumped out at me, but then the name, I never heard of the guy. So I was like, all right, this is it. This is my if it's an old parky and a name I don't know, then I'm in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out about this guy. So I'm going to do the opposite of you. I'm going to look at the card first, and then we'll learn about our boy, Pete Babondo. So yep. the card, we'll just zoom in a little. PSA 6, top to bottom center is definitely off. You can see there's a huge chunk of space down here compared to the thin spot at the top. However, left to right looks great. Left yeah. to right looks really nice. <laughs> it's probably one of the better ones I've seen. Picture looks fantastic coloring obviously like you just said the white you can see some white speckles here and there but you also see white with the snow i love that where you see the stopping that's pretty cool uh there's some fish eyes around here you can see you know, just, whoa. You i think there's a it? few cards in 1951 parkers that have that snow spray effect with yeah the, with the player stopping yeah it looks awesome um what i was trying to show earlier is these fish eyes i think is what yeah we usually call them you can see them there you know corners look Corners look pretty decent for how old these cards are on this card, this PSA 6. Definitely some fading on the bottom right, top right. You can see some wear, but they actually look really, really good. Back of the card, it's a blank back, obviously, but there's some, I don't know what's what we're going to call this, some spotting, I guess, it looks like. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Some discoloration. Age. Yeah, aging. Nope. Patina. Some patina. fine patina. So, again, card looks great, though, for a PSA 6. I think it looks really nice. So, our boy... Pete Babondo, he's a left winger, Josh, from Brayburn, Pennsylvania. I didn't think I'd And his name that. was Babondo. <laughs> Babondo. So over the course of his career, 86 goals, 73 assists for 159 points in 351 NHL games played. He was a one-time cup winner. Josh, he played six seasons in the NHL, but also played with every American-based NHL original six team. So that's pretty cool. What do you have he against was, Canada? I don't know. I didn't like Canada, I guess. First yeah. player in NHL history to score an overtime goal in Game 7 of Stanley Cup Final. 
There That's you go, another, Troy. Another deep trivia fact. I love it. Dropping the and, dimes, the Pete Babondo. So yeah, you <laughs> want to look cool to your hobby friends? You can drop that here's fun the, fact on people. Here's the crazy thing. You look up this guy. He played six seasons in the NHL, which was pretty short. However, he played professional hockey for 20 years. Played in the AHL, the like ECHL, a bunch of different leagues. And he wasn't bad. He was scoring tons of points. I don't know what. There seems like there's a drastic. He just got dropped, and I don't know why. I couldn't find out any reasons. Or maybe just one of those guys. He was really good for six years and then just couldn't cut it anymore, but still could. Like, guys now would go over to Europe <laughs> and play. Maybe that's kind of what his deal was. But it, it was really interesting to see his his professional hockey career is actually really long. Just didn't play in the NHL that long. So this card has a PSA pop of 34. Total PSA graded copies of this card is 174. This one's a PSA 6. So 34 graded copies. This exact card sold on October 23 of this year via the PWCC for 174 US dollars. Current bid right now is 23 US dollars. So get a steal. All right, last vintage card I picked is a 1924 B130. Captain Dunk Monroe. What? Captain one. Dunk Monroe. Captain Dunk Monroe, Troy. Awesome. Get with the program here. <laughs> Sweetest name ever. PSA 2, which is a good. So I had to pick the card when I saw Captain Dunk Monroe. Yeah, I love it. Right? Fun to learn, like you said, about dudes we know absolutely nothing about. And then I don't know if we've talked about the 1924 set much, if at all, at this point. So I thought well, that kind of made it interesting, too. But come on. Captain Duncan <laughs> Roll. This is That's amazing. Sweet. Did you find anything on this guy or is he blacklisted? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I found okay. a lot. First of all, his name's like out of one of those like cheesy romance novels that our wives <laughs> read and don't tell us about. When Captain Dunk, you know, came into the bedroom. <laughs> uh, looks like a serious guy though in his picture, huh? Yeah. He's, he's not he's a guy so. you want to mess with. Uh, and yeah, you're right. Uh, thankfully, there's a lot more online info about uh, <laughs> our boy Dunk. So I got his Wikipedia photo, which I just had to show. That's a handsome man right there, Josh. Look at him. He's well, just... he's not bad looking, but is that the most <laughs> epically bad part hairstyle you've ever seen in your Ooh, life? Or you give fun. it our gong show fashion rating. <laughs> I give him, I don't know. He's looking pretty studly. Like he cemented a... that hair to his head. Yeah, that is cemented. I don't know about the, it's like the off center part. I'm going to go for a six. I give him a six. All right. You're going to like this next one, Trey. Dunk is Scottish. <laughs> Born in Moray, Scotland in 1901. Is this where nice. you tell us you played in Scotland? I did not, but me and my wife went on our honeymoon to Scotland. There you go. In 1924, Monroe captain, captain Troy, the Toronto Granites in the 1924 oh, yeah. Winter Olympics. So the Granites were an amateur senior <laughs> hockey team that was That's chosen awesome. to represent Canada at the Olympics. So it's really I crazy. Actually, at the- I agree with that 100%. I guarantee you, you put a team that's played together forever, they'll go win the Olympics. These yeah, versus like teams. the modern way of taking the best players and kind of constructing a team yep. on the fly. In the 1924 Olympic tournament, Dunk Monroe scored 18 goals. Hmm. That year in the Olympics, Troy, Canada outscored their opponents 110 <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. on their way to the gold medal. He is the first European-born player to win Lord Stanley Cup. There we go. Captain Dunk Monroe. Now, catch, we would be like killing hockey trivia night with today's show. <laughs> so after the Olympics, Monroe was signed by the Montreal Maroons of the NHL, who won the Stanley Cup with Dunk once again, their captain in 1925. I don't try. I mean, should we like nominate him for a Mark Messier Leadership Award? I don't know how <laughs> Messier would present it to him, but he's captain everywhere he went. Yeah, this guy's pretty big. Uh, kind of sad, though. After winning the Stanley Cup, though, he suffered a heart attack and contracted pneumonia while in the hospital recovering. Uh, so, yeah, it kind of derailed his career a bit, but he did come back and play a number of years. Uh, apparently, too, he was like a huge investor guy. Like, I guess a lot of the Montreal players were big time into stocks, and he had amassed a big fortune, but then basically lost it all oh, in the geez. stock market crash yeah. of 1929, which was the precursor or the catalyst for the Great Depression. Yep. Right? So... You know, he had, had a lot of amazing things happen, and, but dealt with some adversity, too. I mentioned he played for a number of seasons for the Maroons until his last season with the Montreal Canadiens was in 1931. 
uh, 32, where I think the teams merge. So looking at the card, again, it's a 1924 B-130, manufactured by the Maple Crispet Company, which is a Canadian candy company based on Montreal. I think they made a lot of popcorn and other okay. stuff like that. There's 30 cards in the set, and if you turn them all into the company, you get a free pair of skates. So on the back of the card, and if you're on YouTube, Troy's going to show that, it, it kind of details what you got to oh, yeah. do to get a, a free pair of skates there. I wonder, like, if it was, if it's like a upper deck like uh, like a bounty program achievement where if those ended up being like a six thousand dollar pair of skates or if you could realistically collect all thirty and get a pretty cheap pair of skates. It's pretty crazy. I think they just they literally send you the blades and you probably strap them onto your shoes or you looks screw like. them into your shoes or something. Yeah, that's awesome. I love this. This is so cool. He's in the in the card. Though the, I should say the card's pretty simple: black and white photo of Dunk, uh, with like a thin black border around it too. The cards in the early 1900s were a lot kind of more interesting, I think, than the yeah. 1920s. Centering is not perfect, but it's not horrible either. I think it's pretty good for a PSA yep. two. Uh, again, a, another pretty decent vintage PSA two card. I think a strong eye appeal. Last sale of a 1924 V130 Captain Dunk Monroe PSA two. Was 125 US back in September of this year, all time high 140 US from the PWCC vault back in May of 2021. You got a current bid? 80 US dollars. There you go. Olympic captain, Stanley <laughs> Cup winning captain. Okay, we're going to switch to modern. The first card that I picked out is a 2019 Upper Deck Premier Jack Hughes Acetate Ricky Patch Auto out of 990 or out of 99 PSA 9. Okay, so I haven't looked at this. Um, <laughs> I, this could be entertaining because this is all writing again when I was like extremely drugged up and <laughs> deep into the issues I was having this weekend. So I'm just going to read it and we'll see what happens. I'm going to start off by saying I wrote like half of my talking points for this card when I was deep in the bowels of hell for my neck <laughs> issue. I'm really drugged up. When I came back to finish it, it made no sense at all. I'm kicking myself for not keeping. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. so. I apparently got rid of it. It would have been hilarious to read on the show. Uh, <laughs> holy moly, was I out of it, Troy. I think I was still out of it when I wrote that. But uh, getting back to the card, uh, PSA 9 is a good grade for the card. Yeah. Um, shouldn't hold anyone back from buying it. Uh, at that grade, the card is a pop three, non graded higher. I honestly chose this one because it number is a really nice patch. I, I like, I think it's a clean design. And I just feel like if you, if we did sort of a list of cards on the come up, right cards that are like building momentum within the hobby i think this would be at or near the top of my list these acetate rpas yeah. from premiere they're kind of awesome and they they seem relatively undervalued compared to other rpas so i think there's a lot of times good value in them i like the accent colors kind of matching the patch and the jersey mm -hmm. for hues on the card uh just a clean design and you know all elements on the card of their own space and, and room to breathe as far as Hughes this year in 27 games played he has 14 goals 25 assists 39 points kind of a breakthrough year for him coming off a career year last year where he had 99 points of course as we all remember um here's a little taste of Hughes back called a mini bio kind of all fun info that I found interesting so Troy Hughes applied for exceptional status at age 15 but was denied so he had to return Ooh. back to minor midgets with the Marlboros. We talked about the Marlboros last week. Named after the Dukes of Marlboro, not, of course, cigarettes. <laughs> then, when he finally was eligible, he spurned the CHL altogether and committed to the U.S. National Development Team in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Played there for two seasons, was the number one overall pick in 2019 NHL draft, becoming just the eighth American player to be selected number one overall. Mm. It's kind of a fun fact. Born in Orlando, Florida, grew up in Toronto. They moved to Toronto because his dad was a, was a college hockey player and then worked in like NHL front offices and coaching. So he got a job with the Maple Leafs. That's how they ended up in Toronto. Huh. Hughes' mom was a U.S. citizen, was a lacrosse player at the University of New Hampshire. So it come from very athletic family. So I don't know. Are they like 20% Canadian then or something? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Can I want to claim him now? I mean, we barely have any good hockey players. Just let us have, <laughs> let's have Hughes, Canada. Come on. 
Trey, he was also the second player from the U.S. national development team to be selected first overall. Do you know who the other player was, Trey? Do I get a hint? How long ago was it? Uh, within the last 10 years. It's going to seem obvious if you don't get it. Was it Austin Matthews? Austin Matthews? Yeah. Okay. He played for the U.S. national development team. Then he played in Europe, then was drafted. Okay. So that, okay. that might throw some people off. Um, yeah, him and Austin Matthews. All right. Pretty good players there. There have not been any sales of a 2019 Premier Jack Hughes Acidate RPA at a 99 PSA 9, so no sales at this grade. But the biggest sale for any copy of this card graded to raw was 1,205 U.S. on March 25th of 2023. Last sale was 851 U.S. dollars on July 30th. You got a current bid? 500 U.S. dollars. You like this card? You, like are you a fan card. of the no, I, Premier I love RPAs? this card. Yeah. I think it looks sweet. Plus, I love the patch. And I like the stitching. Yeah, it's a good card. All right, you got the next I modern do. card. Oh, Cheevers. Excuse me. If you're watching on uh, YouTube. Yeah, I do. This one's going to be quick, Josh. And I, I will say the uh, the modern selection, we were a little, I was a little slim in my pickings for it. But I went with the yeah. uh, 2022 SP Authentic Jake Sanderson rookie auto out of 999. So it's our friend, the SP Future Watch. And I probably just did this because I know Phil loves this guy. So loud collector yeah. loves Jake Sanderson. Did he have is that the Jake Sanderson shirt he had on? He's like, I'm it said I'm buying Jake Sanderson or whatever. Yeah, at the expo. And I don't yeah. think it worked. It said nobody was looking at his shirt. <laughs> so, anyways, I, I, I don't know that much about Jake Sanderson either. So this one, you know, kind of caught my eye, but card self's raw. It's not a 10. If you zoom in on it, there's definitely some stuff you'll see on the corners. You can see by Oops, sorry, bringing that up. On the red border here, there's kind of a chip that I found. So it's definitely not a 10, but again, it's a, it's in pretty decent shape. The auto looks really clean. I, there's maybe a little bit of lifting, right? There's kind of some of these short, shallow lines. But again, looks pretty decent. Um, So, I mean, overall card, the back of it looks pretty good too when I was looking at that. There's so again like all these cards there's kind of like when there's black and grays there's kind of that fading or chipping sometimes that happens and this one definitely has that so jake sanderson himself if you don't know about him bill the loud collector loves him so that's enough for me <laughs> so I, I call that hype he's a d-man for the auto senators this year he has five goals 13 points for eight or five goals 13 assists for 18 points in 29 games played for his career, nine goals, 41 assists for 50 points in 106 games played. He was a 2022-23 all-rookie team selection. And Josh, I didn't know this. He played college hockey at North Dakota. What are they the called now? The North Dakota Fighting Hawks. And We have to get And I don't... Okay, I'm going to be really careful here. Because it's a very political issue. And I, I don't know enough to take one side or the other. So I'm not trying to make a statement in that regard. But... The whole stuff that happened in North Dakota around hockey and the name Fighting Sioux is wild because there was yeah. the huge benefactor. Who was that again? Was that wasn't Ralph, Denny Sample? No, no Ralph Ingolstead. Ingol Ingolstead. It's, yeah, it's Ingolstead Arena, which is and beautiful, he, by the way. But he was very, very adamant. Yeah, that they never changed the name for Fighting Sioux. So he gave them the money to build this like crazy, ridiculous college it's arena. Crazy, <laughs> and every six inches in the entire place. They have stamped the like the what do they call the the fighting Sioux logo? Yeah, that has very similar to like the Chicago Blackhawks with the uh, the chief head basically, yep. right? So that as a way to be like, I'm gonna put this like in granite many thousands of times in this arena, <laughs> so you can never. Now I don't even know what they did with all those, or if they're still there. Or I have no idea, but I remember he said. I think he passed away because that's when they changed the name. Because I remember he was like a big, you change this or you change your name. I'm pulling all my money. One of those kind of things. Yeah. So I don't know. I'd have to read up on it again. And if they removed them all or what happened. But I know now they're the fighting Hawks, I believe. Gotcha. Yeah, that so, whole story is wild. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So again, the last last sale of this card I could find was on December 16th of 2023 for 115 US dollars via eBay. Current bid right now is 35 US dollars. All right, buy it up, Phil. <laughs> there you go. Our last card we're going to highlight. Oh, this one I'm so happy about. 
It's a 2012 <laughs> 13 Fleer Retro Sidney Crosby Intimidation Nation PSA 10. This card at PSA 10 is a pop of three. Only five total graded at PSA. I'm I have to apologize profusely now to anyone just <laughs> listening and not watching on YouTube to see the image of this card because to me I love it and I just laugh every time yeah. I see it. So do yourself a favor if you're listening to the show, go look this card up. 2012 Flair Retro Sydney Crosby Intimidation Nation. Is this the Crosby mean face photo? <laughs> it looks like you smelled something that stinks more than his intimidation face. He's just like, oh ick, yuck. It's pretty I'll try. I'm not a great Crosby historian by any stretch, but he's never been known to be like a physically intimidating player, no. has he? Nope. He's been known to be a whiny baby, is what he's been known as. Maybe I just don't get the concept behind intimidation nation, but that's what I think of is like a like the big intimidating, yeah, physically intimidating players. There were 20 players on the checklist this year, including <laughs> Ty Domi, <laughs> Eric Lonros, Patrick Waugh, Claude Lemieux. So those are guys that you would kind of fit the bill. Yeah. But then they have like Gretzky and Crosby too, who don't traditionally kind of yeah. come up intimidate with you with their skill, maybe. But yeah, yeah maybe I think I, um, that's it. When I think of Crosby, I think of Ty Domi, <laughs> Claude Lemieux. Names fit right in. There's something also on this car that is magical, yeah, so and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be very bold here, and I'm gonna call out Upper Deck for <laughs> doing Crosby dirty on this. Look at the back of this card and the face. You got to zoom in on his face. Well, this was Fleer. Was was Upper Deck? Did they own it? Oh, oh they did. Yeah, Fleer Retro. Yeah, they owned it. Okay. You got to yeah, zoom in look more. At, look at this thing. Oh my! He's chewing on yeah, his uh, tongue instead of his mouth. He's gonna guard. bite like, his tongue off. He's gonna. Yeah, bite that off. is crazy. Well, that's. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's why players wear mouth guards is so you don't chop your tongue off if you get hit. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. So, uh, I have no idea what that face is. <laughs> I'm dirty by upper deck. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> but when you look, think about it. Like, how many cool insert sets are in 2012 Fleer Retro? Yeah, like, everything tons, in that. Tons. I want to get a box at some point and open one of those and get nothing and be sad. <laughs> but uh, so I don't know this is a great opportunity if you're a Crosby collector, you want to grab a gem mint graded, very very low pop, pop three, yeah. pretty cool and uh, kind of funny at the same time. Insert yep. of a legendary player from a certainly iconic set. Only been one sale of a 2012 Fleer Retro Cindy Crosby Intimidation Nation PSA 10. So for only 229 US in November, uh, this past November. All time high for any copy of the card graded or raw was a BGS 9 copy that sold for 563 US back in May of 2022. You got a current bid, Troy? 56 US dollars. Oh, it's a steal at 56 bucks. Go get it. Go get it. All right, those are the cards that we highlighted in the current PWCC Weekly. Again, be sure to head to pwccmarketplace.com. Check out all the cards, not just the ones we've highlighted. Um, and uh, place your bids. Auction ends on Sunday. Okay, personal pickups time. You have nothing? Nothing. You're I don't even know what hockey school. cards are. <laughs> yeah. Christmas tournament mode, right? Yep, Christmas tournament. Well, we, we, we actually did kind of have one. We have one that we shared. Um, and so... We had a gentleman's bet with our friend Jay from the Top Shelf Cookie Sniper podcast on our Discord when our Minnesota Wild took on the Bruins December 19th. Uh, we said, we give you, you give us a card if we win. We'll, we'll certainly give you a card when we lose because that's <laughs> the Minnesota fatalist and all of us. But the Wild pulled out an OT winner, 4 3 yep. score. Kaprizov scored two goals in a game. That's crazy. But the best part, Troy, the absolute best part in, uh, Winning the bet, we hauled in this 2016 yep. 17 Black Diamond Ryan O'Reilly out of 99. So we win the bet and we get O'Reilly Troy. Pretty awesome card. That's awesome. Uh, I'll be sending that to your house to add to our <laughs> Ryan my collection. collection. Yeah. I can't believe we won. Uh, thanks to Jay <laughs> for a fun bet. Uh, be sure to check out his Hockey Cards podcast again, Top Shelf Cookie Sniper podcast. He does a fantastic job. And then the other thing too is we did. Buy a couple boxes of SP Legends, yeah, when they, and uh, some cheap synergy as well. Yeah, well, that's our show. If you like the episode, please leave a rating, review on Apple, Spotify, whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show, want to support us, want to Cards Gong Show Discord server, please consider a five dollar month donation. Join our auto one ninety nine support level tier on Patreon. The link is in the show description, on the podcast apps, and the YouTube description as well. You can go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com, and search 
or click on the become a patron link, I should say. You go to the Patreon website, patreon.com, and search for Hockey Guys Gong Show, or as a uh, uh, links other places do. Uh, there's links everywhere. You can <laughs> find it. We are on social media, so hey, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dollar Box Ventures LLC. Uh, we'll see you all in 2024.